Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, a little bit better. This is a robust sector that we're into. Good morning. Heck yeah. So <laughs> my name is Ernie, Ernie Aboot. I'm Vice President and Midwest Conference Series Director for Real Estate Journals. So on behalf of our staff, I wanna welcome everyone to our 19th, 19 years of the CIP Industrial Summit. So anyone here 18, 19 years ago, the first one, raise your hand. No? Okay, Mary Ann, Mark, cancel that singing lobster gram for that person that was going to, uh, that I thought would be here today, so cancel that. Um, no one's gonna come up here and slap me if I make a joke, will they? Uh, the, you know, COVID did not start in Wuhan, China. It started at a Las Vegas convention by about, by among industrial developers. So, you know, the past two years, unprecedented levels. Nothing to laugh about, but so serious that it's impacted our business at un with unprecedented fundamentals, never seen before in 19 years. So we are very pleased, very happy to every year, focus, bring the Siri community together to assess the industrial state of the market, find out where we are today, learn lessons learned from the past, and forecast what's ahead for, our, for ourselves. So what we do. Uh, the numbers are astounding. According to JLL, I'll, I'll throw out two numbers, one billion and one trillion. According to JLL, the expectation for industrial demand space, warehouse space, one billion square feet across the country. I can't speak specifically for Chicago, our pros will talk about that, but one billion square feet is projected for the next five years. Thank you, e-commerce. One trillion is the valuation of that industry over the next five to seven years. So the fundamentals are extremely strong right now. Um, you know, it's it's uh, at least Kustin cannot make it today for personal reasons. She was going to speak on her second panel, but uh, according to Newmark's Q1 Industrial Market Report. Um, they found that rent is not only cost occupiers, but uh, landlords are passing the baton of typical landlord costs. Some, for example, have declined lease offers for demising space unless the tenant is willing to pay demising costs. That's unbelievable. I mean, you never would have heard that, what, 5, 10, 15, 19 years ago. Uh, so developers are continuing to build while trying to rectify this despite high commodity material costs. We will definitely get into that. We have some representation from FCL Builders and Harco Murray talking about that, second panel. So we do have three panels. First panel's talking about state of the Chicago land market. I would like to invite those folks up to the panel, uh, to the stage now. Uh, but we have a significant number of, of uh, marketing partners, sponsors for this event so significant that I typically list each one individually, but we have about 43 sponsor partners to assist us, partner with them. We work closely with them over the years. So we recognize those folks. There's about 43, we continually rotate their logos. We also have a QR code you'll see on the printed program that will give you access to the attendee portal. More information about the sponsors and speakers. So I encourage you to take a snapshot of that. So I want to give a, uh, I want to mention a, a big thank you to our sponsors for being an integral part of this program. We appreciate working with you. Those who have been with us for a long time, those new to us, we truly, I truly, on my behalf of my, my staff, thank you for being an integral part and we, uh, we appreciate working with you to sustain and promote and build your market share. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and I could go on and on, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, to Joshua Hanna. Joshua is a is partner at Kirkland and Ellis. Josh focuses on. various asset classes, including multifamily, industrial, office, hospitality, and opportunity zones. 
Josh has been recognized as a leading real estate lawyer by Chambers USA and the Legal 500 US since 2015 and by the best lawyers in America since 2018. So I'm gonna turn it over to Josh. Uh, be mindful that there is, we do encourage questions from the audience. After the first panel, we'll take a five minute break and then again to the second panel. Thank you. Thanks, Ernie. Is this Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, thanks to the panel. We've got an excellent panel here. I think it's fair to say, um, as Ernie alluded, uh, the state of the Chicagoland industrial real estate market uh, would be an understatement to say it is strong, has been uh, incredible. And, but, you know, I think we want to talk today about, you know, how that continues and, you know, what uh, might be standing. Well, uh, I never left. So I opened my firm in right. April 15th of 2020, the heat of the pandemic, and uh, turned out to be wow. an outstanding opportunity. Um, the pandemic, unfortunately, has been the best thing that ever happened to industrial real estate, uh, maybe fortunately, depending how you look at it. But uh, I just you know, you go to all these events and it's great to see the enthusiasm and uh, participation and encouragement from our peers. Thanks, John. Uh, Josh. Josh Bauer, um, Duke Realty. I, I would say my favorite thing about being back in the office is getting out of my unfinished basement that I was working in, out of. Um, when the pandemic hit, I, I think at the beginning I was working out of the dining room. I brought the big screen down. So it was taking up a lot of space in there and then moved into the basement. Um, and it was about 55 degrees down there. My wife would be doing laundry while I was on video, you know, camera behind me. And so just getting out of there and getting into, yeah, getting back to the office, seeing people. So it's good to be back. I'm Kelly Disser. I'm with NAI Hiffman. <clears throat> and uh, I think the, the, um, the thing we've enjoyed most about getting back to the office is just seeing our, our teammates and team members. Um, and as a broker and, a, and as a brokerage team, the communication that goes on between uh, between everybody. It's just it's just a much better situation. Okay, great. Yeah, I can't wait for the uh, nostalgia pieces on Netflix about uh, the work from home. Good old days <laughs> with sweatpants and, and the kitchen table. Uh, so, okay, John, let's start with you. So tell us, how long is this robust growth of the, in, of the market going to continue? What headwinds could potentially disrupt the current cycle? Well, the top topic we see today is like inflation. People are concerned about uh, gas prices, food, construction, uh, energy. It's uh, a disruptor. Uh, interest rates are increasing. There's geopolitical uncertainty, political dysfunction. Um, and all these things we, we've kind of like seen before, but not really all at once, you know, nuclear war threats. Um, so the market, however, keeps sustaining itself and growing. And, you know, the, the set first quarter of 2022, uh, has only been beaten by the fourth quarter of 2021. So just incredible growth. Uh, these things are threatening, but I don't really see that uh, the market slowing down in any shape or form for, for years to come. Care to add, Josh? I think, I think that was perfect. <laughs> Well, so, so let's focus a, a little bit, particularly on the, on the interest rates. Obviously, you know, we've got, uh, we've had a couple of hikes and uh, more projected. So how are those rising rates impacting, particularly how you're underwriting development deals, Josh? Yeah, so the way, the, the way that we look at it at Duke, I mean, everything is based on our exit caps and trying to solve for a spread above that. So um, we're, we don't need, you know, outside debt, um, 
So interest rates going up don't necessarily impact us on our underwriting in that regard, but they do, uh, as you watch cap rates start to move a little bit here. And so when um, people started talking about rate hikes, you know, a lot of people were like, no, cap rates aren't tied to interest rates. Everyone sort of disagrees on, on that. Um, but as we've seen over the last 30 to 60 days, as you talk to some of the capital markets guys, um, cap rates are, are going a little wild right now. And it, and it differs on um, what the product type is and what, what the term is who the buyer is, buyers that need, uh, need debt or leverage, um, it's, it's different than buyers that are all cash. Um, so buyers that need debt and leverage have to solve for a return that's higher than their cost of capital. So um, when we watch cap rates move, we have to uh, solve for a higher yield. And so um, you know, land prices are crazy, construction prices are crazy. So how do we bridge that gap and, and create that same yield and the only trigger that we can move is is actually increasing rents. So, you know, we, we we'll see what happens. I mean, right now, no one really knows. Um, there's not a ton of velocity, enough velocity to know how high you know rates, cap rates have moved because of the interest rates. But um, it definitely impacts all of our all of our worlds. Yeah, you guys see anything different? I mean, it's obviously been a uh, you know super low rate uh, period for a long time here now. And so, you know, throwing a bit of a shock into the system. Have you seen the impact yet? Uh, how do you see it? Uh, Kelly, John? I'll go first. I just, some of the uh, owner occupiers represent our investors. They are looking to get ahead of the uh, curve a little bit. They think their sense that interest rates will continue to rise. So uh, just yesterday I was with the owner and uh, He's got another year to go on his term, so I referred him to uh, Jay Dice's office at Union National Bank, and uh, it's just it's a concern. It's on the radar, and what do you do about it? So when interest rates get to a certain level, it may be better to lease than to own. Uh, and what is that number? I, I'm not sure. Six and a half percent, seven percent. You know, driving down 294 today, I saw a billboard that said 5.21 percent interest rates for. That's probably for home loans. I just remember two years ago refinancing at about two and a quarter percent. So these are these are big jumps, and the the monthly payments are are definitely affected, and uh, it it it's a concern. So I'll, I guess I'll speak to interest rates um, from a I guess an investment perspective, and where we're starting to see an impact is on uh, some of the smaller uh, investment deals. Which are financed a lot differently than like uh, Josh, one of Josh's larger institutional spec developments, as an example. So as those interest rates rise uh, and the yields are, are are being pushed lower with you know with cap rates and uh, in, in competition, at some point you know the uh, those deals and those spreads become too thin. I know we've had uh, a couple transactions recently where our, our lenders have been looking at, um, I guess as they call it, stress testing to see if the uh, if the deals work at closer to a six percent interest rate than. Uh, maybe 5% that they'd quote today, which was high threes, maybe six to nine months ago. So it's been a pretty uh, significant increase in a relatively short time, um, which where we go from here, I think will be pretty interesting what we're here to talk about. So, okay. and so Kelly, sticking with you on the, the other you know, obvious factor that's that's been out there for a while now is inflation. And as well as you know, the supply chain disruptions that we've seen. So how speak to the impact of those on construction costs, particularly, um, you know, how has that been absorbed? Uh, any signs of normalizing in, in those costs? Yeah, so I think um, construction materials in the construction industry is, is probably one of, from what, for what we've experienced and, and witnessed, um, some of the more significant impacts on pricing relative to or because of supply chain issues. Um, throughout 2021, we had a number of different construction projects that we were involved with. Uh, and from an institutional and spec development perspective, you know, the clients are, are, are more sophisticated and, and handle a lot of that themselves. Um, on the build the suits that we completed, you end up becoming a lot more involved with your clients and talking a lot and, and interfacing directly a lot with the, uh, the general contractors. So throughout the course of the year, we had, uh, I think, four or five different projects and we're continually getting 
pricing updates on different projects as they evolved and pricing evolved and and to watch you know steel pricing go up uh two and a half times from january to september uh, was a major major impact on every one of those projects um from what we're hearing um I, I think there's been a couple larger projects nationally that that may have um softened a little bit of the demand so we're starting to hear a little bit of a um I guess a tapering to those those increases, um, but you know there's it's, it, there seems to be a such a, a strong backfill of demand for continued development. I don't know how much of an impact that that may have. Yep. To add um, a little color as well on that, the I think historically or the last several quarters, build the suits have been about forty percent of the development, so sixty percent spec, forty percent build the suits, and I think as we move on and, and go on, um, you're going to see that become a wider spread. There's going to be even a larger percentage of, of spec versus build the suits. Um, the, the other thing that we're seeing is that, that we're doing, we're, uh, you know, typically we do one per 10,000 um, for our docks. We're putting in all of our dock equipment, maxing it out day one, because dock, um, dock seals and levelers right now are somewhere nine months um so if you don't put them in day one and you've got a you know user that needs all the docs and they need it quickly the building that has them all there uh will get the will win that deal so you know it costs us more money on the front end but um as a long-term holder we, we figure you know we'll own these buildings a long time we'll put all the docs in day one so just you know things like that um and trying to get ahead of uh, all the lead time delays and stuff well relative to those increases um some of the comments that we've heard directly from from users i know there's a lot of pushback on the rental rate increases that uh we're seeing in the market um but i think the reality is a lot of the users um across different industries are, are making so much more money now they're able to absorb those increases so of all those build the suits that we had uh started in early 2021 every single one of them completed despite significant increases from start to finish in the budget All right, well, let's let's talk a little bit about you know, those lease negotiations. It's, I mean, what kind of trends, Josh, have, have you been seeing um, you know, recently? It's momentum or leverage shifting um, landlord to tenants, vice versa. Yeah, um, yeah, my friend Dan Fogarty and I were just catching up on this. Um, you're seeing massive rent bumps. Um, rent growth, especially for REITs, um, same store NOI, is critical. So we're excited about the fact that we can, you know, that we're able to push rent bumps. Um, some of the merchants may not be pushing quite as hard on those. So, you know, you may see some groups at three and some groups at four and wonder, you know, what's market. And I think that, you know, you'll start to see some normalcy in minimum three and a half. And we haven't gotten a deal done in the last six months, less than a three and a half percent percent bumps. And it's going, it's going higher. Um, and, and the other thing is term um a lot of the buyers are preferring to buy buildings that have a uh, role so they want you know leases that are expiring in a year or two or three versus 10 year 10 year leases gives them a chance you know the mark to market and we're in chicago and you know our mark to market here uh for duke is somewhere in the 20 you know 25 percent uh, to 35 percent when leases roll the coasts are like a hundred percent um which is crazy so a lot of these buyers are preferring that there's short-term leases in place to mark up the rent um so we're being asked to do a lot of you know five-year leases and a lot of the brokers are questioning why we would do that and you know trying to do a 10-year deal or a 12-year deal and we have to push back and say no so i think those are the two biggest trends other than just that the rates are you know rental rates are going crazy um and you know we've heard i've heard a bunch of users say well, we can't wait till the market slows down and we can hammer the landlords because they hammered us and you know landlords are just doing their job and getting what the market will bear for the space so it's it's, it's an interesting time john do you see you know tenants how have the tenants been faring in in this market you know what's driving their decisions on space um are you seeing any kind of changes Yes. Um, so to add to what Josh is saying, tenants are you know coming out of long-term leases, five years, ten years, are seeing you know rates that have jumped 25, 30 percent in the last two years. And what happens is they're like, 
well, I'll get an advisor, a broker to help me find a better deal. They go out to the market and that lack of inventory is, is not helping matters for, for their, uh, from their perspective. Uh, but most of these companies are experiencing record years and they're cash rich. And so you hear a lot more talk about like renewal options, what is fair market value, write a first offer. Uh, how do I secure the space next door? How do I, you know, get involved with the sublease, sublease opportunity from the tenant next door, or buy them out of their space? So it's kind of like a race for space. And um, there, there's new product on the market, but, you know, it's all large blocks. There's not, you know, if someone's in 10 to 100,000 square feet, it's limited inventory, especially up by the airport. I know I-55 reported about 1.7%. 2% uh, vacancy rate. These are unheard of numbers when you see buildings coming out of the ground all day long. Uh, and Bill Keeley here is building some of those. And, uh, you know, a lot of the risk takers like uh, Mark Good and Mike Brennan and uh, Aaron uh, Martell, they're, they're going on spec and uh, it's, it's working out for them because the tenants have to have space because they threaten they're, they're, they're threatened by uh, losing market share or even going out of business if they don't make the right decisions. And, and their, uh, your sense is, you know, they, they feel like the, the boom is continuing, right? And, and so um, they had the best year ever. Uh, is a sense that uh, you're getting, you know, no concern that this is, this is gonna, we've got to take what we can get um, and rely on the, the economy continuing to you know, support that? Yes, I mean, it's worked out so far and uh, it's like playing the game of craps. You, you, yep. It works until it doesn't work anymore. So you could go home and put your chips away or you can keep playing the game. And um, most people are doing that even with all these, these threats out there. So I don't, I don't see it slowing down at all. I think that a lot of the users, um, you know, they just have so much pressure from their customers to grow and fulfill new contracts and take care of the relationships that they, in a lot of cases, have no choice but to do that. Um, you know, in sub sub market to sub market, it varies, but you know, we're seeing cases where you've got, uh, you know, a building that's leased that had been sublet two year, you know, two three years ago, and now you've got two tenants that both want the same space, and you know, situations right. like that where it's. Um, extremely competitive because of record low vacancies, if any vacancies in certain submarkets. And, and Kelly, are you seeing the same uh, trends in terms of you know, spec versus build to suit? Um, you know, how do you see that playing out over the next few years? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to find land uh, if you're a user <clears throat> that is, is not developer controlled. I mean, in, in this last cycle with where rents have gone and with this demand, you know, there's a lot of great developers in this in this room. And if it's a desirable site, um, as competitive as that market is, most of those sites throughout all of Chicagoland are are spoken for, controlled in some in some fashion. Um, we actually just had a, a call with a client of ours who's a uh, a cold storage user. Um, he, you know, he just couldn't understand why. Um, and he's hearing this repeatedly, I think, and this is even nationally, um, why when he goes to buy a site that a developer owns, the, the market value, uh, or excuse me, the, the price that they're demanding is 2x the, the market land value. And, you know, we could try to explain to him, well, that's, the, that's their business and that has all their profit uh, and everything rolled up into it. And if not, you know, the, with their opportunity cost, they just as soon not sell to you and pick up the next deal behind it because there's so much demand. So um there's just a lot of pressure um across various industries to, to try to continue to expand and even in chicago um which you think you can go out as far west as you can go forever it's in the in the in the areas where there is labor and real demand it's it's significantly constrained in, in very much mature markets yeah let, let's focus a bit on chicago specifically and you know how how do we feel the Chicago land market is positioned going forward? Any particularly notable sub-markets um, you know, that you know, to watch? Uh, what's been hot? Where do you see things turning, John? So yeah, uh, Chicago sometimes gets a bad rep on the uh, news front nationally. However, the industrial market's been one of the strongest across the 
country. And the reason for that sometimes is because of our overland transportation network, intermodal system, air, air freight business, uh, sea freight. You've got like the greatest inland shipping port in the world all comes together in one spot. You can't avoid this area because of Lake Michigan going east and west. So it'll always be in flavor. Um, 12 and a half million people live here. Yeah, some people leave, but a lot of new, highly educated people come back or, or come to the market. So I think Chicago will will be fine. You know, if people are like, why would you buy buildings in Cook County? Well, I bought buildings there because that's where everyone lives and wants to be. And the taxes are high, but the rents are growing faster than the taxes are. And the uh, assessor will probably uh, figure it out one day. I think I heard the Cook County tax bills won't be coming out till second half won't be coming out till January. It's because they have stacks of files in their office and they can't figure out what to do with that. So their new plan isn't really gonna work, I don't think. So um, I think Chicago, it's just a tough city and we'll, we'll always be strong and we'll, we'll do great. I think um, back to your question about just the sub markets and where in Chicago, um, the the markets that don't have any buildings or vacancy are obviously the places you can push your rents. Um, you know, we're building in in Cicero and we're building in Geneva. In Cicero, there's not there's no competition. In Geneva, there's there's several buildings. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be able to push our rents a lot higher in Cicero than we are when we're competing with five or six buildings. So when we're looking at development sites, we're we're really trying to look at you know how many buildings are we going to compete with, what are the barriers to entry, um, and so you know those infill markets that have always done well. I think you'll continue to see unbelievable rent growth as long as demand stays. So, you know, O'Hare um, and stuff, the stuff that's east of 294, the parks and into the city, um, you know, you can't keep up with the rent growth. Um, you know, every every time you see a new comp, someone's hit a new high watermark by a dollar. So at some point, demand will taper off and somebody will underwrite a deal at rents that they can't hit and it'll be a problem. And hopefully you don't have four or five of those development deals going. Um, but until that happens, you just you, you keep chasing and getting aggressive in, in those locations and you have to be a little bit more cautious and methodical in some of the locations that you know you wouldn't consider infill. Now, some developers have hit absolute home runs. Um, I think Adventure One in particular that have done deals in um, Hunley and some of these markets that maybe were untapped or they got into a basis that was just so, so low because no one really, no one was thinking about it um, and you can hit an absolute home run there. You know, Duke's mentality as a long-term holder is we wanna to continue to hold these buildings in the best possible locations for the longest possible term. If you're a merchant developer and you can do a deal somewhere and you could flip out of it and hit a home run, that that works really well. So there's different ways to go about it, but um, you know, our mentality is to continue to chase those infill deals and, and pay up for them. I'd just like to add to like, the submarkets I see uh, shining are like I-65. Um, people are, before the institutional developers didn't really want to be over there, but now they're all taking positions. Uh, I was involved with the Secretary of Commerce in Indiana. He said they went around the country and met with 64 countries and 63 of them signed up to do business in Indiana. Uh, a lot of the companies that were gun shy about going over there from Bedford Park or wherever in Chicago are now jumping on board. Um, I-57, there's lots of new development there and it's going to take down Hillwood, did an 800,000 square foot deal in uh, Moni and uh, LPCs, put about two and a half million square feet up in Country Club Hills, that's all being absorbed. And um, uh, CRG did a million square feet, the cubes there at 57. So I-90 West, you mentioned about uh, Huntley, there's some new developments in Hoffman Estates, Palatine and uh, uh, Schaumburg. Uh, areas you didn't see a lot of action before are, are now hot. Uh, Kenosha, um, I-55, I don't really know if, is there much left there, Kelly? There's not no. much land left there. Um, Molto's got their site and we'll see what happens with that. And Northern's got some land, but yeah, 55 is, is full. And, and John, you mentioned the, you know, the taxes and how that plays out. I know, you know, we have clients, you know, maybe not so much the local clients, more 
know, national, international, that do still view Chicago with some hesitancy, uh, due largely to uncertainty over how the tax reassessments are, are going to play out? Do you, I think you said, you know, a next year thing, do you, have you and, and maybe Kelly seen um, you know, that type of reaction from other investors? Um, is there a continued, and, and I think it's also less of an issue in the industrial market than the multi and, and office, um, but how do you see taxes uh, working through? I guess I, I, don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that the one, if you ask me where, if there's one soft segment of any submarket in all of the 19 submarkets throughout Chicago, uh, in my mind, it, it would be, you know, the 30 to 100,000 square feet in the city of Chicago, you know, and there were a number of buildings that were acquired kind of in that Kinsey corridor uh, area and very nice buildings. And, you know, for whatever reason, the demand just is not, has not been there over the course of the last 18, 24 months. So. I mean, it's not just all taxes, but, you know, with what's happened to the city through COVID, um, you know, all that, all that sure. comes together. Okay. I just want to touch on another trend, you know, ESG, green energy, you know, how, how has this been impacting your, you know, development plans? I mean, Josh, I'll start with you and, and Duke. Yeah, so Duke, um, is is big on sustainability um so what we're doing and what you're seeing pld do and um and, and others is you know all of our buildings are being built lead certified um we're doing we're doing uh we're running conduits into the parking lots for electric charging vehicles we're reinforcing our roofs um for solar those are probably the biggest things that we're doing right now um you know not we we do other non-sustainable things like you know trying to fu uh, future proof but try to you know build these buildings so that they can be held for you know owned for 25 30 years but from with with you know stronger dock equipment and, and whatnot but from the from the sustainability side i think all of the you know, the hvac units um energy efficiency the lighting all, all of that stuff is something that we pay close attention to but i think the biggest things are probably the conduits for for electric um, parking and then and then solar capabilities on the roof right now. I don't have a lot to add other than it seems like the return on investment for green energy hasn't really materialized yet. But what I've heard is there's about thirty trillion dollars of dedicated funds towards that sector. So it may be something everyone wants to start getting involved with and understanding better because it's it's here. I just haven't really come across it that much, but right. what I understand is it's it's a mountain coming our way. We um, we got a couple proposals from users that with their RFP sent us a spreadsheet for us to score our building. Um, and, and literally, I mean, it was just a number one through a hundred. And if you didn't get to a 70, you know, 70 to hundred, your building was green, 40 to 70, it was yellow and less than 40, it was red and they wouldn't lease buildings that were red. Um, neither of these groups. So users now are, are paying very, especially the publicly traded companies are paying very, very close attention to the buildings that they lease. And so, you know, you could win or lose a deal by yeah, the sustainability of your building. Okay, so I think the uh, we had a contraction in uh, in the current quarter as as was released on my drive here. Uh, does it look like a recession is coming? And if so, will the industrial real estate market even notice? Uh, unfortunately, yes. Now, is that six months, twelve months, thirty six months from now? Um, I think remains to be seen, but I mean, it's inevitable at some point. It's, it's just a cyclical um, industry and cyclical world, but you know, it's all the momentum is still there. You start to see some, some headwinds and see some things, you know, that uh, the freight rates and volumes are, are down and that's, that's typically a, a leading indicator. Um, you know, the, the interest rate situation and what that might uh, do to the current momentum. Um, Given the you know the number and the significance of of those um, increases and potential future increases, so 
I mean, I think I think that we will. Uh, it's it's also possible, as you as you mentioned, that you know we I think the greater economy could see some type of a recession, um, but the industrial real estate world may not notice it as greatly, um, just because of the the growth within the e-commerce sector and the infrastructure that continues to be built out to support that new economy. Yeah, I think. Um... We're, you know, I don't, I'm not an economist, but I think it's two straight quarters of uh, contraction to be in a recession. So we, we won't know for some time. Um, but, you know, all of the, there's definitely, yeah, storm clouds, you know, red flags out there. It's just that the industrial has such a low vacancy and such strong demand drivers for the space that most of us are not, we're not worried, you know, we're, we're certainly not worried of an 07, 08. Um, but we feel like we can weather any type of slowdown um, that we're poised to do that with such a low with such a low vacancy and such strong demand. Uh, according to Ke Craig Hervitz from Collier's, the vacancy for first quarter of 2022 is 4.91 percent, which is the all time low on record. So, like Kelly was saying, yeah, maybe uh, the national economy may suffer, but we're in a really good spot being an industrial because of the incredible demand for e-commerce and related industries. Um, so I, I think we're somewhat resilient and uh, there, there, of course there's unforeseen events that are gonna happen that could adjust the, uh, the frame, but right now we're, we're lucky and we're fortunate to be in this industry. Nobody's ready to call peak just yet. I think the current cycle is like going for 11 or 12 years, is it something like that? So, well, it's bit, yeah, I mean, it's coming out of 09, 08, 09, 10, that the, uh, the great financial crisis, right. the GFC. I mean, it's been a long time coming on this recovery. Um, you know, although I think COVID, you know, provided a, a little bit of a reset. Um, and now, you know, this growth now coming forward out of the last 18 to 24 months. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it has been, feeling like a little bit of a long run. I add one little piece is um, Amazon, from what I understand, did $150 million million square feet of uh, acquisitions through leasing and uh, purchases uh, over the last 18 months. This goes back about two or three months and they're expected to do that again the next 18 months and that trend's supposed to go for seven, eight, nine years. I've heard they've taken real estate in-house. So like they're, their leasing and now property management in-house, that could be a threat to our industry because uh, they're such a dominant player. Um, but that, that's what I know about that. I think there, there's there's always so much confidence in our industry, real estate's a little bit of a lagging indicator. I, you know, I, I enjoy talking to some of my clients that are in different sectors to hear their thoughts on kind of where we go from here. And I think a lot of these things are are definitely on their minds as well. I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Anybody? Okay. Where's Ernie? He usually has good questions. <laughs> Ernie? I, I mean, not really. Anyone on my staff is still free, but I, I don't have any questions, actually. Uh... Okay. Yes. Uh, you know, I can't speak specifically to, I guess, how they're staffing those, but I mean, it's you, there's no denying the the uh, impact that Amazon has had in Chicago and nationally on the on the industrial market. I think they've done close to I think 60 deals. Uh, we track that. Um, I know a lot of people do, um, and it's just a huge huge driver. And and a lot of other groups draft off that, um, and a lot of the other e-commerce uh, providers uh, that. Are, are even fulfillment firms for Amazon, you know, they've been growing. So it's, there's, there's more to even the, I think that growth than just what's directly attributed to that, to that name. I, I think they are able to staff uh, because they do offer good pay packages and benefits. But I think what happens is people get there and they have to work way harder than they did at their previous place of employment. So 
I was fortunate to do a large manufacturing deal in the South Market recently, and it's right next to an Amazon uh, facility. And I volunteer to put um, uh, sheets of paper on the windshields to track their employees to go to our manufacturing plant because it's a great place to find people. You know, John, I do have a question. Josh, I, I do have a question. Uh, and I said this, I made this question or comment during our Trans and Logistics Summit that we had last October, but uh, for every delivery that sent out, out of five packages that are delivered, two to three get returned. What are you seeing out there in terms of the, dealing with these returns? Are you starting to see maybe a new sub-market class of, of properties needing to be built to accommodate these returns? It's a problem for the industry. So what, what are you hearing? What are you seeing about aspects or prospects to, to develop these return facilities, which, uh, which I believe will continue to be at that steady two to three for every five delivered? My only experience with that is like reverse inventory. Yeah, reverse mile. Yeah, we're working with an apparel company on I-55 and uh, they have so many returns coming in and they have no space. It totally jams up their their whole system and they can't find another location. They really, they're leasing uh, and they, they want to own and it's it's a real problem. Uh, so it's a dress company and if someone will order three dresses to get the, the one they want and they have to spend $600 for each one of those dresses or whatever it is they have to return it to get their other 1200 back. So what happens is, you know, they just don't have enough shipping doors to handle the reverse inventory needs. Yeah, no, reverse logistics is, is, is a mess. I mean, every user has a different mentality on it. Some just throw the stuff away. Um, I've been in multiple warehouses where they've got entire sections of the warehouse set aside for returns. And it's just half open boxes. It's completely disorganized. Um, I think, you know, companies, some, some more than others, they haven't really figured out the best way to handle it. So, so uh, you know, there's a plenty of time before, I guess, companies have a good strategy on how to handle that. I think companies are all talking about it, trying to figure it out. Do they have certain warehouses just for returns? Do they have, you know, certain portions of their warehouse? How are they handling it? But a lot of groups just throw that stuff away. And a lot of it just piles up in these warehouses because they don't know what to do with it. And we talk to some of the warehouse managers when we tour and and they really don't they don't have a good strategy that's why they tell you just to keep it when you want to send it back they're like just just keep it right. sounds right for some good ideas <laughs> <laughs> corner of this market oh, yes oh, one sec mike is there any thoughts about a, a shift in mindset towards just in case to avoid supply chain issues, pushing inventories up above a level that's sustainable long term on a consumer demand side? Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly what's going on and what's driving a lot of this this growth. Uh, different larger corporate users that are going out to secure uh, additional warehouse facilities to store that additional number of days of inventory, so they they don't get exposed if there's a another issue yeah i think you said the word uh just in case because you know we talk about just in time versus just in case they used to have a week of inventory now they've got six weeks and when consumer demand for all of this slows um you know that product won't move as quickly and so they you know some every company is going to handle it differently but the fact that they're all agreeing that they want to have more of it more product available that's great news for everybody in our industry, which we're not quite sure if it's going to be, you know, it's by company, company, from company to company, some have more than others, but it's all, it's all positive, not, not for us. Yeah, I think it's like called safety stock. So you're trying to increase your inventories by five to 7%. So you don't get caught off guard again, like you did during the pandemic. Uh, but like you said, it, it'll come to an end and some will have too much product and won't have any, have nowhere to send it to. Question in the back. Yes. Uh, one, hold on for the mic. Great questions, everybody. 10,000 steps. Okay, go ahead, question. What percentage of uh, upcoming development would you say is allocated to uh, manufacturing that's coming back from overseas for like, you know, as I guess they call it onshoring? Uh, 
you know, I think, I think a lot of the manufacturing deals end up being build a suits just because they have uh, specific types of operations. Um, we had a couple last year that, that ended up building buildings um, just because they didn't quite fit quite right into an existing spec building. And in a time also when there was such limited inventory, um, they ended up building, building their own building. But um, there certainly are cases where, and we had, we had one of these also where a client of ours took an existing spec building that was planned and jumped in um, just at the right time to, to modify some of those plans before you know concrete was poured or, or really any of the materials were required. We, we actually did that with ML Realty. Um, so if you, can, if you can catch a spec development at the right time, sometimes that's a great, a great uh, alternative for a manufacturer as well. I, I agree. I was going to say the same thing. Uh, manufacturing deals. I mean, 90 plus percent of the deals that I see are warehousing and distribution. You just, you know, the, the, the manufacturing deals I do think are build the suits. There's so many nuances to those users and how they plan to manufacture with power and whatnot that they really need to get ahead of it far more so than groups that just need more space for warehousing. Yeah, sometimes the, the exception to that is timing. You know, in corporate America, maybe you know, it comes up, we need this space next quarter, and they just don't plan for that. And that that issue, that concept is really what drives the spec market here, you know, in Chicago and, and nationally. Time. You know, what I've seen is these manufacturers, I, I don't know about who's coming in from out of the country, but locally here is they are, the spec development that's up, they're trying to figure out how to fit their operation into a logistics facility, which is really challenging. So um going to try to bring you a deal at 5301 uh, Roosevelt, um, which is going to plan to be a logistics center, but maybe you're not out of the ground yet. You change your plans and be op open to that sort of thing. So it's like Kelly said, it, it's really a build a suit for the people that are planning it properly. But when you have rising construction costs of 30, 40, 50%, your plans all fall apart. So uh, it, it, it's a uh, work and strategy. Yeah, for I mean, for brokers representing users that have food requirements or whatever it is that requires landlords to modify their building, if there's something that's under construction or just before construction commences and the landlord asks for an indemnification or something, I mean, think about doing that because the savings, you know, we're, we're quoting a deal right now that's a food deal and we have to completely change our slab and underground plumbing. I mean, by by getting an indemnification from them and, and moving forward with design will save millions of dollars uh, and it's only going to cost them like $50,000 on an indemnification. So it's it's significant dollars that uh, users would have to invest themselves um, because landlords just aren't handing out, for the most part, aren't handing out huge buckets of tenant improvement dollars right now with such strong demand. So it's something to pay attention to. Make sure your lawyer's looking at, at that indemnity. Yeah. Uh, yes, maybe one more question over here. Two more questions. Okay. Thank you. Are you seeing any interest in the EV space with components, batteries? There's a lot of federal subsidies, uh, an aggressive plan in Illinois and the like. Are you seeing any interest there? So one of the uh, buildings that we're building in Elgin actually is going to have a couple of charging stations. Most of it's for cars. Um, the, the industry and the, within uh, the trucking industry just isn't there. The infrastructure isn't there uh, to charge the trucks, you know, on a, on a national over the road basis. Um, and in talking to the users, it's not really yet on their mind yet either because it's far enough out. You know, they've got other pressing issues, interest rates, you know, cost of fuel, et cetera, to, to worry about. Um, but definitely seeing more of the the EV infrastructure going into the, the car parking lots, um, especially as, as what Josh mentioned with some of the big corporate users that are more uh, focused on sustainability and, and ESG. Well, it does seem like like five years ago, we were talking more about planning for autonomous cars and getting rid of parking lots and things like that. Haven't heard too much about that recently. I know there was a Korean company in the market that was looking for a massive facility in the south suburbs uh, to employ 1,100 people. It was a competition between Illinois, Ohio, and Georgia, and Georgia ha has won that. So, but the point was like, these electric cars are going to be dominating the road in a very short period of time, three to five years. Uh, they're already building uh, somewhere, I think, in um, 
Shorewood, maybe somewhere down there. There's a massive factory. Uh, so it it's coming. It's just a matter of time. One more. Question. One more. Go ahead. Um, my question is for all four of you individually. So much about success in business is forecasting correctly. And of course, no one has a uh, crystal ball. Two years ago, when all this began, so many people were panicked. And without trying to sound glib or overly confident, all I could think about is somebody who works in this industry and sells to all of you, you know, many asset classes, commercial real estate isn't going anywhere. And so I wasn't as worried as maybe some people I knew socially. What my question for the four of you two years ago, would you have did you feel as comfortable, confident, upbeat as you sound today? Two years ago in the end of April, um, at least for me from the lawyer perspective, we were you know, planning on the rent mageddon uh, of May 1st and wondering if anyone was going to pay the rent, if everyone was going to get foreclosed on, what was everyone going to do when everyone stopped paying rent? Uh, then it kind of came and went and you know, we started to feel better, I, I suppose. Saw clients, you know, we did see clients slowing down and taking a bit of a wait and see approach, but then you know, that didn't last very long. So uh, I would say two years ago, there was still a lot of uh, hesitancy at this point. But again, once you got past May and you still ended up getting 90 plus percentage uh, of people actually paying, you started to even things out. So two years ago is when I opened my real estate company and uh, I had signed a lease before the pandemic was known. So I had no choice other than to go forward and work with consistency, diligence, focus, discipline, and uh, there was no other choice. So that's what I did. And I'm not going to change my plan now. It's just a matter of uh, when you, you see these threats, you just have to work harder, double book your time and uh, make it work. Pedal your bicycle twice as fast. Yeah, it's a good question. I think two years ago, I was concerned because industrial is such a consumption based business. And with at when when COVID first hit, nobody was really leaving their house. Um, you know, I, I don't think we realized what incredible impact it would have on our business that people would start shopping online and e-commerce would boom. So when it first hit, I was definitely worried. Um, but you know, in retrospect, it's it, it was very, very good for our business. Um, I think you know, moving forward, kind of perception now of the industry versus back then. I, you know, we just, you know, we all we can do is take the information that's in front of us um, and and utilize it the best of our ability. And, and you know, we manage, we spend a lot of the develop, development shops have capital partners and we have a fiduciary responsibility to, to be smart about it. And I think just, you know, with where we're at right now, we just have to be very careful and smart about where we select to do development deals. Um, because if demand does taper off and you can't get your underwritten rents, things aren't going to look good on those deals. So we just have to be careful and be smart right now. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest thing that I'm focusing on now versus you know, even 12 months ago, I felt like you couldn't lose. You, know, you build a building anywhere and, and you'll, get, you'll get at least. I think right now you have to be more methodical and smart about where you choose to build. Yeah, I think um, there were definitely some sleepless nights. I mean, even you, I think you forget how bad that it was uh, and how dark that it was through March and April. I mean, we had clients that wanted to buy buildings and we didn't know if we could close because we didn't know if the county recorder was going to be there. You know, the bank wasn't right. open. So um, I guess it's never as bad as it seems and maybe it's never as good as it seems either. Uh, and we have pretty short memories. Um, so plan, uh, hope for the best and plan for the worst. I did become more confident in my expertise in what force measure meant. <laughs> so, uh, and anyway, forbearance. I, I think we're, uh, we're out of time. So Great. I want to thank everybody on the panel. Thank the audience. Great questions. I uh, really enjoyed thank it. You, thank you, Josh. Thank you.
Let's, let's uh, it's great to be live again, catching up on relationships, seeing folks face to face is great. Let's now take our seats. Panelists are here. Melissa. Yes. Yes, nice to meet you too. Our panelists are here with the exception of Elise Kustin. Uh, Elise uh, had to cancel, unfortunately, last second personal issue. Um, so let's take our seats, folks. Todd, we're good. Hello, virtual world. Thanks very much for sticking with us. We hope you're enjoying the informative sessions. There are two more to come. This one and the last one focusing on capital finance. Okay, the next panel is industrial development, leasing trends, construction challenges in today's marketplace. The panel is going to be moderated by Andrew Miltich. Did I pronounce that right, Andrew? Andrew is a principal at College Chicago Commercial Real Estate within the Industrial Services Group, where he has been since 2011. Andrew focuses on representing corporations and institutions in the acquisition, disposition, and development of industrial real estate, concentrating primarily on the Chicago suburban marketplace. He has extensive background in construction buildouts, purchasing, contract negotiations, which serves him well in the real estate industry. A consistent leader within his market, Andrew has been involved in a wide range of project types and relationships, including strategic real estate planning, sales and leasing, relocations, incentives procurement, Andrew has completed over $300 million in deals since 2011. Thanks for moderating, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Ernie. And uh, thanks to everybody at the first panel. That was great information from everybody up there. Appreciate their time. Uh, so we've got a great panel in front of you guys here. Uh, we're gonna be talking about topics such as industrial development and how technology and design trends are affecting new in these industrial developments. We'll also be discussing current construction challenges like supply chain and how it's affecting building material costs. Before we get into that, I'd like to take a couple of minutes and just have each of the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start. All right. Uh, Chris Moore, Director of Project Development for FCL Builders. Um, we're a 45-year-old design build firm uh, nationally located our headquarters is in uh, itasca and we have 11 offices across the country <laughs> okay i'm really screwing up this morning already uh melissa roman uh, i am the vp market officer uh, for prologis um, i oversee development for prologis here in the chicago area um, i think everybody knows who prologis is so i'll Let's pass it on to Patrick. No further Thank you. Patrick Clay, Director of Development for Arco Murray. We're a national design build contractor, um, widely recognized as the largest industrial builder in the country. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alba Colavidi. I'm with CRG. I'm an architect by training, and I've been in the industry for way too long. So I don't believe I was here the first time, but I've been here for a while. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So we're all familiar with what's going on with the ongoing supply chain crisis out there. But what I wanted to ask the panel was, what specific industrial building cost increases have incurred lately? And what are we anticipating for the next six to nine months? And do we think these material building prices are going to stabilize anytime soon? Sure. Um, you know, I, it's really it's really interesting. We we had a chance to talk about this earlier this week, and and everyone talks about the steel story, and and that was the big crisis of last year. And right now, we're seeing a huge problem with tilt and concrete. Um, you know, in in our national practice, we do a lot of work in Arizona. Uh, we kind of noticed it very acutely there in that market before it hit here. There's been a four dollar per square foot increase uh, in the Arizona market, and in some places here in Chicago, upwards of six dollars per foot. Now, I think that there's a lot of things contributing to that. I mean, would you agree, Chris? Oh, 100%. Um, concrete, tilt, steel. Um, but the big one is, is roofing. I mean, yeah. right now, how far in this market precast is out, you're carrying roofing escalations for four quarters at 15%. So you're carrying another 2 million bucks just in roofing for what it might be. Yeah, I have a building right now with a roof, with a, just a temporary roof because we can 
figure it out how to get the materials. It's insane. And um, ironically, I received two uh, pricing updates last night on roofs from two different general contractors. Um, we were told that prices would hold until the end of June, and they've pushed, they've moved that up. So we're seeing escalations again here on June first. So how why was the spread between those two groups? Um, it was the same notice. <laughs> are they given any reasons as to why the roofing material prices are increasing so much? Uh, from what we've been told, it's been just raw materials. Yeah. Is that they just can't get it? The the big freeze that happened down in. Uh, Texas last year started it, and then the demand just kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's a, it's the you know it's a supply and demand issue, right? In and it's it's strictly based on inventory, mostly based on inventory. There's a there's a labor tie-in as well, but um, you know when when we experience this explosion in construction in the industrial market, obviously uh, there was an opportunity to work through the backlogs that we had, and I think that everything is just. You know more acute and when you do have disruptions nationally that tie into our our inventory story regionally then it just makes things uh you know worse so and i so, think also the type of roof in this market um we're typically a ballasted roof well last year everybody uh you know because of steel costs decided to do a uh, tpo roof uh, us included um which <laughs> which also um you know created a, a shift in uh availability of you know fasteners and things like that so um that that uh contributes to it too so patrick you mentioned tilting concrete is one of the big issues here as well uh and we know there's only a couple suppliers here in the chicago market have you guys tried dealing with anything with getting them from other you know other parts of the country and what's involved with doing that if somebody does that I, we, we try to stay regional um it, i think there this is a larger question in terms of also the the, the manufacturers of labor and location um, of you know the unions that do deal in that market more acutely. I think as you get further away from Chicago and you have greater opportunities to deal with tilt in a way that might be more efficient to to build those boxes. But uh, in terms of like having someone across the country pour something and then ship it over to Chicago, that really doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're really dealing with labor in in, in regional market basis. Uh, so, same thing in, in Arizona and in Texas and you know, Southern California and places like that. And what's the current lead time for precast right now? I've heard a lot of different numbers out there. I'll say a year, right? Uh, that was the last thing I heard. Yeah, longer than that. Uh, yeah. Si now, yeah. Right? 16 months. Yeah, 16, 16 months. months. We, we just priced to build the suit. Um, yeah. A million square foot build the suit and we were being told November of next year. Yeah. Wow. It's, and it's all the labor. Like there is no labor. Uh, in the region to get all that going. So, and it's not um, economically feasible to bring, like you, uh, like Patty was saying, uh, bring precast or till from another, from other places is just going to be not economically doable. That used to happen though with, with other material types, right? So when we experienced the office boom, when everyone's building office buildings, in some cases it was cheaper to get your glass from China right to, sh to ship it over but i think you know and, and i i think later we're going to talk a little bit about the international scene and how that's further caused disruption within our our regional markets uh our domestic markets in general but um to to sort of cross ship and and those materials across the country really doesn't make much sense great thanks oh yeah we've explored it looking at um you know just because of the lead times i was quoted 2024 on a project last week um for precast uh but the just shipping it makes zero sense and then with all the fuel surcharges right now that just just adds on to it yeah. you're probably 20 30 percent more for precast yeah. we and, that, and that's getting it from local here in chicago no that'd be if you brought it in from another source a plant in you know michigan or uh minnesota do you have something else, Chris? Yeah, no, we, we went down the rabbit hole of trying to explore tilt here in this market. And is it a possibility? Yes. Is someone going to do it? Probably. Um, but it's just, you know, who has that pain threshold, you know, to, to spend that money? I mean, precast right now is 22 to 24 bucks a face foot. Doing a sandwich panel of tilt in this market, 34, 35 bucks a foot. And throw on a $7 roof and $22 steel. How badly do you want your building? Yeah, I like to say, what is your threshold of pain, right? right. When I <laughs> talk to developers, because it, it really does just come down to that. It's about economics. 
And, and maybe paying those premiums makes sense if you don't have to up pay for land value. But when you're up paying on both ends, then it just kills deals and, and the deal ends up underwater. So, you know, we're, we're also considering tilt, uh, I would say in, in the Chicagoland region. Yeah, our buildings in the south, in Illinois, South Illinois are tilt already. So we don't go down that far with the precast. How, how far south? Far. Off <laughs> like, I-85, <laughs> I-55 near Dwight? No, 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 like south, no. really south. <laughs> south <Illinois. laughs> like, near um, uh, Missouri, <laughs> let's put it that way. So how are you guys all addressing these long lead times and supply chain issues? You know, how is it impacting these new development projects? For, for us, it's just booking things as soon as possible. And then obviously the, the previous panel mentioned uh, force majeure is there's force majeure writers now that go along with everything. So it's buy the precast, the steel, the roofing now, and then have those clauses in for the roofing, the fuel surcharge, all that, and then prove it out to said developer when that time comes. Yeah, I, I would agree to that. I think for us, you know, being a design build outfit, that's kind of the savior of a lot of this, mm -hmm. a lot of this pain. I mean, when you're when you're dealing with, you know, unpredictable commodity escalations, the only way to really beat the game is to design early and buy early. So and do you guys, and do you guys see anybody that's jumping ahead of the line and saying we'll pay that extra surcharge to get it faster? Yeah, I, I see. I see it suggested. Um, and sometimes it's not even possible so and we're procuring our materials internally in advance right now out into like i said 2024 um so as developers now we get to play general contractor too on top of our normal day job so you could just um, hire me earlier congratulations <laughs> <laughs> that was my line chris so um i'm lucky because we haven't uh we're the enterprise right so clay will procures everything way ahead of time and then we just um use it when we need it so that's how we went deal with this so are there any ways that we can contain these construction costs during this inflationary period that we're going through right now no. <laughs> D design early buy early yeah. <laughs> right it's like yeah but it's hard to protect yourselves even when you, if you buy a roof early you're still subject to you know, cost escalation. So um, we do our best to, to negotiate things, but there's just no guarantee at this point. So you guys mentioned labor as being one of the issues out there. Is it labor problems with finding construction workers to work on these sites? Or is it more with, you know, the manufacturers at their facilities? And do we consider this to be either a short or long term problem? Okay, uh, well, I see it. Um, there is like the people that are trained and the, um, are retiring. And now we have the kids or the new, um, yeah, the, the newer generations, um, but we don't have anyone in the middle. So we're lacking that piece of um, generation, if you say, if you may say. So I don't know if you guys agree with that. Um. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think it, you asked a question about how different market sectors, you know, begin to impact, you know, our labor issues in the in the industrial market. I think it's a it's a resource problem. Uh, you know, even down to project managers in our office is a little bit as you described, but mm -hmm. you, you just don't have enough bodies anywhere, right? And and you can't really train someone overnight to right. to to be an engineer, uh, to be a civil engineer, to be a mechanical engineer, to be an outstanding construction project manager, and then also. Or even a carpenter or a, or a carpenter yeah that's right and 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 so there's there's an issue in the trades there's an issue i would say in the uh intellectual end of the professional end in the office but then you know they're just there's there's just labor constraints in general right mm -hmm. and you you would think that um <laughs> unemployment would be zero with all the with all the jobs that are needed you know i hear uh uh end users and developers tell us that they have warehouses that are understaffed by hundreds of people right so how is that possible and we're still building more so there, there just seems to be either no one willing to work or just no people that are that are trained. So I do wonder if it's a it's a bit of a long term issue out there. It definitely seems like some of the younger generation of people 
don't necessarily want to be doing that type of work out there. I mean, my son graduated from high school last summer and out of his, you know, big friend network, I think only one kid was going into the trades. That's a big problem. That's what we need to get focus on from now on. The trades is not um, a bad job or a lesser job than a professional job, right? I mean, we are all skill laborers, right? Right? It's, um, I have two boys and one is in the trades and one is in college. So I am so proud of both of them because one decided to use his hands and his ability to make things. And the other one is um, decided to use his ability to make music because he's a musician. So we don't need specifically to go to college to get a good salary and good, I mean, the unions right now are crazy and in construction, you cannot do anything without them. So um, I think that we need to focus more on the trades and CLECO, CRG and LJCs all uh, for the trades. And we're trying to, to implement that and focus on that and get more kids. I call them kids, right? Because <laughs> 18, 20 years old are my kids. So uh, the, the new generations that are coming out of of our college or the high school, they need to know that it's okay not to have to go to four years in college and get all that loan and, and get into that all financial struggle. So you can just have an apprenticeship and start working. And if you decide to go to college and become an engineer, it's up to you, but you don't have to do that. But we need um, more campaigns to increase that. Like we need more carpenters, we need more electricians, plumbers, my gosh. We can find a good plumber. <laughs> but anyway, a good plumbing company. <laughs> that's what I meant. A good, a good uh, plumbing company is just insane. So that was my two cents. <laughs> and for the panel, as part of what we're seeing, the people that didn't go into the trades, let's say in the 2007 to 2010 range, yeah. there's just that gap in, in labor. Yeah. Um, I, that's part of it too, I believe. Yeah, our generation for some reason was taught that we need to go to college no matter what. And nobody thought of the trades and the gap that was gonna be in the future or creating for the future. My old man was a carpenter. Right. And when I was growing up, he's like, you're going to college because you're not gonna do what I do. Go get an easy office job where you sit behind a computer. And I, I tell him now because he complains about it. And I'm like, well, this is your fault. Yeah. You're the one who says, don't go, don't go to the trades. Go to college, get an easy, cushy job where you sit behind a desk. <laughs> and now you're a contractor. It, yeah. Well, I, I wasn't going to be a professional hockey player, professional fisherman. So I, was, I wasn't going to make it as a football player either. So. So I'm the opposite. My dad is also in construction. And I wanted in high school in the summer to go work in the field. And he wouldn't let the girls work in the field. We had to work like in the shop oh. because, you know, he didn't want his girls out there. <laughs> I, hopefully times have changed, but you know. Yeah, and you know, it's, it does seem that the labor story does really tie into, you know, the future projections too, right? Because th there's gonna be a slowdown, there has to be. At some point we become our own bottleneck and that's kind of what we're saying. And it's, and it's not just the people that are designing and building the buildings, it's everybody that's tied to the industry and tied to the supply chain and, and tied to the industrial market as a whole, so. Um, very, very interesting times, you know, and we also talked a little bit about, you know, how, how we thought the increase um, in interest rates would affect the market, right? And I, I do a lot of talking. <laughs> I, say I, get, I, I, I get paid to talk. I talk for a living. You know, I was on a webinar maybe two months ago and said, oh, when rates go up, everything's going to slow down. That hasn't no. happened, right? It's only increased. In fact, the, the higher the rates have gone, the more industrial capitals come in yeah. and the larger the deals seem to get, mm -hmm. right? So people are calling me talking about 500 acre builds. That's insane. And there's more than one of them, right? So that's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, it is, but it's also, it, 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 it exists, but it also has the same problems that we've already discussed, mm -hmm. right? There, there has to be people that have to design and build these things. We have to get materials to the site. Um, uh, who knows what, what kind of vacuum several mega projects will cause in the already constrained industrial market with a huge backlog, right? Yeah. So do you see that changing at all anytime soon with the projected rate hikes that we've heard are supposed to still come later this year and next year? Two months ago, I would have said yes. Now I think no. Mm -mm. I, no, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. 
I, I think what we've what we've really what's really happened is we've identified the strength in this asset class, right? And and we talked a little bit about that. Um, there there's a rotation from office in into industrial, and I know that on the surface it looks like they're two completely different asset classes because they are. But we're doing a lot of industrial co working, and and those flexible spaces are used for a, a, a wide array of purposes, right? And there's a lot of emerging asset classes that we're starting to get into outside of market that are starting to make their way into Chicago as well, which is a combination of maybe executive working, co-working, industrial space. So there's, I think that the market uh, has proven in terms of like the lead times traditionally being shorter than, than going vertical with a super tall tower, the access to, to uh, transportation, right, has, has always been more ideal, more pleasant. And um, what, what I believe may happen is a, re a receding, continue receding from economic centers, what would consider to be central business district, to some places uh, outside of the central business district, which would traditionally be industrial-like assets, now being some form of industrial manufacturing, logistics, and co-working. So I, I don't think it's going to slow down. I think it will only increase um until we and if you think about only four percent of the united states is industrialized in general so that's a lot of land that is left available for construction opportunities so oh. so technology always seems to be changing so rapidly and with that the demand for it from tenants and building owners and some of the people on the first panel talked about this a little bit as well but what type of technology trends are you guys seeing with new leases and projects, you know, EV charging, smart building technology. We mentioned, you know, solar panels. Are you seeing more and more of that? All of the above. I mean, it's that's that's predominantly what we're seeing. We are also, as a landlord, looking at smart technology for managing our buildings because we um, self-manage them. So um, whatever we can do to make our um, maintenance techs and property managers' lives easier, um, we're starting to implore those those uh, opportunities in the buildings. Yeah, and well, we have we have a national end user to maybe the second largest logistics company in the country. Anyway, um, they're really, they have a huge sustainable in initiative. And so they're they're very concerned about lead buildings. We're, we're doing with one with them now, lead industrial. Um, we, we have a solar division in our office as well that has been there for, I would, maybe three or four years. It's still emerging, but there's lots of activity. We're doing a lot of solar array, solar farming on top of industrial assets. Uh, and almost every single one of these buildings do have EV connection, EV hookups as well. So, and I think that's becoming an industry standard. Yeah, you have to prepare your buildings to get there if they're not right now needed, but you have to have them in the future. They're going to, it's coming. So yeah. They have so if a building design. doesn't have EV charging stations, is it, is it difficult to be able to add that to a building? What's involved with that? Well, right now it would be with the, the lead times we're seeing on combat transformers. So uh, that's a that's going to be a major bottleneck is having the infrastructure there is great, but not being able to supply the power to those EV charging stations is going to be the next bottleneck. And and how many charging stations will there typically be at, at, at call it a two or 300,000 square foot building? Right now we're putting in infrastructure for 30, 40. I mean, that that's... 4,000 or 3,000 amps of power right there. So we've talked about, you know, lead certified and green buildings and kind of spinning off of what we just were talking about. You know, a lot of people have heard of those terms, lead certified green, you know, help us define a little bit what green means and what type of green trends are you guys seeing in the market and including in your projects? Well, we used, um, we used to try to do the green roofs a while ago, but that didn't work. That was way too heavy and too um, cost, it wasn't cost effective. What consisted of that though? I mean, what, it was, uh, well, you wanted to have your um, grass or build or, or make a farm um, on the roof of this 1 million square foot building. But um, the roofs were not really good for that we found out that, that we had leakage and uh the steel was going to be a lot more and the owners were not really liking all of that those issues so we walked away from that right now and we are doing the solar panels which is more like a farm 
that's how we are getting into the green stages. Yeah, at Prologis, um, our buildings, Prologis buildings are uh, lead silver, um, and it's definitely, um, our tenants are very interested in that. Uh, you know, we have, our buildings are solar ready. Um, we do all the LED lighting and all that. One of the things we're taking a look at right now is um, reducing carbon footprint and how to, you know, there's an enormous amount of um, carbon and concrete. And so how do we get our carbon footprint down? So it's, you know, uh, carbon curing concrete, thinner pavement sections, um, you know, uh, all, looking at all that technology. Patrick, anything to add to that? Uh, no. <laughs> so it, what's involved with taking, you know, a roof that is not set up for solar panels now? Is it difficult to be able to convert it over to it? I mean, do you have to, is there, you know, more weight that goes on top of it? You have to factor in bracing for it. How difficult is that of a process? From what we've seen, it's been adding, you know, additional bar joists, um, shoring up columns. Um, in some cases, it's making footings larger. So you're cutting up the floor to, to carry that load. Are you seeing a lot of that or requests for that happening? Or is that think, something you think will just be happening kind of on new buildings moving forward? We're seeing it on buildings going forward. Um, we haven't dabbled a whole lot with the, how crazy things have been in the, the going in and remodeling buildings. Right. So I would, I would have to defer to... Bill Keeley and see what he's seeing in that. <laughs> and I think on some of our assets, I personally haven't been involved, but um, on a, with a ballasted roof, you've got some additional capacity if you take the ballast off the roof and put a TPL roof on. So it's less rework of the structure that Chris mentioned. Um, so we've done that on a few buildings, but not in this market. Melissa, you mentioned about carbon footprint, and I'm glad you brought that up. You know, it's, it, seems, it seems there are a lot more companies that are talking about trying to reduce their carbon footprint, things like that. Are you guys starting to see anything from clients or projects where they're specifically trying to focus on this? You know, and if so, how are they going about achieving that? Not necessarily carbon specifically, but um, they definitely want to know um, the sustainable and green um, features of the building. Um, so we've had meetings to review, you know, what we're doing with, with the client and explaining, um, you know, how, how we're getting, getting to lead silver and, you know, uh, employing new technologies like the carbon cure, thin concrete pavement, um, thin floor slabs, um, fiber reinforced slabs that are, are thinner, um, just trying to take the, the concrete, I'm sorry, the cement out of the concrete, basically. Yeah, and for you, those you don't know that the um, the carbon comes from the cement making process. So the less cement in a in concrete, the the greener the concrete. From a sustainability point, pretty yeah. difficult with precast walls. <laughs> it is. Uh, what other type of new design and operational elements are companies requiring for the future? You know, increased power, trailer parking. We've all seen, you know, Amazon's got vans parked everywhere at all these things. You know, what are you guys seeing from your client requests out there for new projects? Yeah, it, it's it's better to have more than less, right? You can't, you can't come back and add later. It's, it's better to kind of future-proof and provide space for the unknown future. Um, Meaning more car parking or more trailer Some, parking? Well, sometimes more car parking, more trailer parking than car parking. I think car, the municipalities really push, you know, the, 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 the number of cars that, that have to be at these industrial buildings more or less. And sometimes it's, it's way too many cars, right? The, if you think two cars per thousand square feet some, and you, you're dealing with a 1.5 million square foot box, it's way too many cars uh -huh. and there's not enough trailer parking. So um, docks and trailer parking for sure are things that, that are being requested that we, we pay closer attention to and, and maybe even to find ways to, to mitigate the amount of car parking on site um, without having to uh, argue too much with the local municipalities. So. Going to variances. Yeah. What about office out in these, the build out for these, right? I mean, all the, all the effects that COVID had with changing of office out there. How is that? What are you guys seeing from industrial buildings with offices, right? I mean, at first it was, you know, hey, there, we need to spread it out. We need to have more or more, you know, less, less common space, more private offices. You know, is it more per square footage per person employee in there? What are you guys seeing with that? Yeah, I mean, what I've seen is that every, uh, 
our clients are asking for private offices more and more. We're trying to tell them, okay, it's okay. We're going to be, it's going to be okay again. It's, you don't need so many, <laughs> right? Hopefully. Um, but yeah, the, the square footages are increasing because everybody wants to go into the private spaces, which before the trend was to everybody out in the open, but no, not anymore. I don't know if you have seen that, but that's what we... Yeah, no, absolutely that. And then break rooms are just getting ridiculous in size. They're just, you know, mm -hmm. not only the break room just for eating, but then, you know, the socializing to, to retain employees. So, you know, ping pong tables, pool tables, all that kind of stuff. They need to accommodate all that to retain the, the employees. Yeah, companies are making a very large investment in the employee um, spaces um, to ret retain and attract um, people. And yes, we're seeing much larger offices, um, overall offices, a lot of private offices, upgraded HVAC. Um, we're, we've tested uh, pathogen fighting lights in some of our offices that are supposed to kill um, uh, bacteria on surfaces. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the days of the black box industrial office are, are over, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's interesting too, you think about the, like the rotation of, of capital from commercial class A office into industrial stock. I think that we'll continue to see, you know, a greater uh, amount of attention paid to, to the office space within industrial buildings, but also I think the ratio from either logistic, shipping, logistic space, warehouse space, and office will maintain you know, the same number. So these boxes, I think, will continue to get bigger to help support that. So the office footprint in general seems like it's expanding, but maybe at the same time, it's not expanding that much because are some of these you know, companies saying, hey, we've got 20 or 30% of our workforce that is just gonna be fully remote now, so we don't need that many people in the office. That's right, that's what I think. Have you guys seen any significant changes in building or code requirements by some of the local municipalities that's affecting the way that industrial buildings are being built? We all know some of them are not the most building friendly. I think that's the story of our lives, right? <laughs> With industrial, there are always problems, not problems, but um, just- Opportunities. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I know some of them push back on trailer parking a lot. Yes. And Wisconsin is one of them. And also the pushback on trailer parking is really a location problem, right? So mm -hmm. you, you see a lot of industrial buildings being occupied or, or being constructed in residential areas. Well, then the, there's going to be a battle, you know, based on trailer parking. And um, municipalities, I think, for a long time, it was always thought that EFIS is bad, you know, precast is bad please make this more decorative. <laughs> what can you do? So there, there are, build yeah, that's right. So depending on where you are, uh, you know, there are building standards that you have to adhere to, which I think, you know, do, they do take more time, but, but it, in the world that we live in today, um, maybe it's not a bad thing for things to slow down. Right. Right. I think that when it slows down, finally, we're going to get to the, where we were at normal capacity, right? Right now we're way ahead of ourselves. But I think once we slow down, we'll get to normal. But the um, like you were asking, the going back to the municipalities, they made us do all kinds of stuff. So they we they people living in those uh, places don't see the trailers. So we have to do all kinds of landscape or fencing and just to screen it. Yes, tons of money, a lot of money goes into that because yeah they, they just don't want to see it and it's not just recent this this has been i've been doing that on my building since the beginning of the 2000s so and i think the trailer parking thing is twofold it's they don't want to look at it right it's ugly mm -hmm. as well as people think trailers they think trailers are going to clog our streets there's going to be you know um yeah that they just don't have they come um, cities don't feel they have, they have the infrastructure to um, handle all those trailers on their roads. So that's, we see it both ways. One thing we've started to see, and it's been the result of, I guess, some bad press, is the um, removal of smoke evac fans. Um, I think everyone saw the Walmart fire in Indy. Everyone remembers the Room Place fire. Um, and the one in Batavia not too long ago is 
municipalities are starting to say, okay, our, our firefighters aren't, don't know how to run, you know, smoke evac correctly, you know, is their loss for huge casualty. So that's something that we've been in talking with municipalities to eliminate that. So you don't run that risk of an entire building coming down in the event of a fire. Yeah. And are you guys also seeing FAR continue to change and get smaller or get increased? Stumped. <laughs> I mean, we push it as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, the, the, municip the municipality will push back. Obviously, they want more green and trees and uh, pedestrian spaces. Um, so it's, I think it's a balance, fine balance, um, depending on where you're building and um, what you're able to do. Yeah. And also what the site will allow you to do, right? It may be zoned for a certain kind of FAR, but uh, due to wetlands and other issues, you just might not be able to get it at a, at a price that makes sense for the deal. So yeah, you just push it as far as you can, <laughs> as much as you can. <laughs> Many of us heard about multi-story industrial buildings being built in other parts of the country, like the coast, things like that. Do you guys think we'll see any sort of multi-story industrial in Chicago anytime soon? Why or why not? I mean, it's coming. I have, I'm already designing them, so. Yes. <laughs> <They're here. laughs> again like two months ago i would have said no yeah. right um and we we have a we have a client that's been talking about it a lot and has been reviewing proposals for it so mm -hmm. i think the big question is what's it going to look like and this this segues into what you were talking about these mixed-use spaces um you know is it an industrial building with residential on, i'm making this up residential on top or is it um, you know, a distribution center with a manufacturing or, you know, so I think it comes down to what it actually, it's going to happen, but what, what's it going to look like? Or, or office above, right? Above, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could do anything mixed use, really, if you yeah. put your mind to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're already trying to solve those problems. So this happening in this city. I, I, I know, I, I think that there's an, it's an incredible like flexible asset class, yeah. right? I, we're we're going to be finding, and it, I don't think it's going to be just two stories. It might be three, right? And and you know, on the East Coast, uh, we're we're doing multi-level industrial. Chicago, outside of the O'Hare market, hasn't really seen it, but I I do think that it's coming. But it it's going to have to pencil, right? It, it's gonna it's gonna have to tie into the economics of the deal. Um, uh, there's a site that we were looking at where it just might not, but people do want it and, I, and there's good reason for it. Now, I don't think we're talking about multi-level docks, but there, there's gonna be some transition to the second level that makes sense for monetizing monetizing the parcel. Yeah, I've heard the land has to get to a pretty high significant value it's in order there. for it to pencil out. <laughs> yeah, I think it's getting there, right? <laughs> okay, I think that's all we've got. Uh, I think we got a couple minutes for questions from the room. Does anybody have anything? Here we go. When you mentioned multi-tenant buildings uh, that you both have drawings or you have interest, what size are the multi-tenant? Do, do you know what, you know, if how, many, how big the building is and how many uh, square feet per unit? Oh, so the one that I was talking about at grade, it's 4, 400,000 square feet and that would be double above. And, you know, I think that that could work for, depending on the user, that could be a single tenant situation. It could be a dual tenant situation. So you would basically bifurcate the box, split it in half, have two 200,000 square foot users on both levels. Um, I, think th I think that scenario to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't think that, but you could also have four above and two below or one below. And two, I, you know, the mix is really kind of dependent upon what the, what the tenants need. Um, and yeah, so. Hi, my name is Kevin Waco. Um, I just wanted to make a comment when we talked about the roofing prices. Um, we're doing a project in Texas and we were told that a chemical plant was damaged during the ice storm last year and that put a significant uh, delay on roofing materials. That's one of the many stories I've heard. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I don't. I haven't really, I don't really know exactly the source, to be honest with you, but I can find out for you <laughs> and I'll get, so. Yeah, it's partly imports, it's partly that, that plant, it's, every time I turn around and there's a new, a new reason. Yeah, it was the, it was I, the freeze down in Texas that right. froze the material <laughs> and then the hurricane with the PVC, it's, it's, yeah, we yeah. can go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Right. Any commentary on automation, robotics? Filling in for the labor shortage. Have you heard anything on your end? Latest? Well, we know that everything, our the biggest e-commerce provider is going automated, right? It's all robotics. And yeah, we have seen a lot of that. We have a few buildings that that's been implemented, but it has been implement being implemented for many years now. It just got really emphasized during the pandemic. And that's what I think save the industrial world because everything is e-commerce and this client was thinking why in the world everybody is going to the stores if you can just have it shipped and now that's the way we live right so yeah for sure i and it, i think it's also kind of interesting about like the e-commerce boom um you know because of of what we're seeing at a global scale, the disruption we're seeing at a global scale, I think that we'll see a manufacturing boom as well in the States. You know, uh, it used to be what we, we used to make things here. We don't make many things now, but we're gonna have to, right? And I think that that'll help alleviate some of the lead time issues. But it, as the, if this were a sign curve, as e-commerce start to stabilize and then, or, or continue to persist, I think we probably have peaked in some respects. Um, reverse logistics, I, I do believe, Will, will become a, its own predominant asset class. There, there's gonna be more manufacturing buildings that are built um, to, to help augment some of the constraints that we're seeing right now in the material and commodity market. And so in a, it's a funny way to say, you know, Marianne asked a good question. What do you think will happen two years from now? Two years ago, we were talking about office. Well, I think two years from now, we'll be sitting here at the same panel talking about all the manufacturing buildings that we're doing, right? And, and be dealing with some of the same issues. Um, Good issues though, right? Yeah. Lots of lots of construction. We saw a lot of robotics with e-commerce like everyone else. Um, where we're seeing robotics now is in the cold storage. Um, we're seeing a lot of demand for cold storage and people don't want to go work in a minus 30 freezer. So um, very narrow aisles, robotics, we're seeing a lot of that in cold storage. Any other questions? One in the back? Nick? So storing on site at, at this point, we're procuring materials like precast a year out. So it's not getting made till it's being shipped. Um, if you can get roofing early, we'll store it on site. If there's a double handling charge, obviously, but you're not gonna pay that additional quarter of escalations. That's the only thing we're seeing as that can be delivered early. Um, you know, some of our subs are taking PVC pipe early and storing, storing it in their yards, but as, or is anything else being stored on site, you know, the lead times are so far out there, yeah. you can't get it sooner. Yeah. So yeah, so right now there's not really a worry of where where to go with it, right? One by the time it arrives and the, the site is ready to accept it. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, panelists. Thank Appreciate you very much. It. Thank you. Insightful comments. We're going to segue. We're going to go right into the third panel, folks. Uh, running just a bit behind, but we want to get into the third panel, which is focusing on uh, investment and financing solutions for industrial owners and investors. So let's get into the capital side of the business. We have some great panelists. Uh, we have a moderator, John Nyhan. If you can come forward, panel. Okay. All right, we're gonna kick it off here. I'll segue. So grab grab a seat. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Let's keep it going, folks. 
the trend is our friend. The fundamentals are strong. So let's uh, continue with the third and final panel. Uh, let's finish up some conversation. Let's take a seat here. Again, we're talking about investment financing solutions capital markets. It's going to be moderated by John Nyan. John is partner at O'Keefe, Lyons, and Hines. John represents a variety of, of clients in state and local property tax valuation and planning matters. Prior to joining O'Keefe, Lyons, and Hines, John was chief of staff at the Board of Review for Cook County, a quasi-judicial real estate tax tribunal where property owners appeal valuations set by the assessor. In addition to the supervising day-to-day -day operations, John acted as the board's senior hearing officer, resolving complex commercial and industrial property valuation claims. Prior to working at the Board of Review, John represented the Cook County Assessor's Office, including as its chief legal counsel. John served on the association's executive committee with oversight, responsibility for several departments within the office. Thank you, John. Panel is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that introduction and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, we're gonna have hopefully a lively discussion about property. Uh, we're not gonna have a discussion about property assessments and real estate taxes. Um, I think we're gonna have a much more upbeat conversation. Um, uh, and in spite of the potential emerging headwinds is the state of the industrial marketplace, you know, what is it? Uh, I'm glad to be part of the program today and um, We've got our panelists here. We've got Alfredo Gutierrez, president and founder of Sparrow Hawk, Brock Hare, senior vice president, business development, Indiana Economic Development Corporation, Craig Daniger, senior vice president, Claris Partners, and Dan Fogarty, chief investment officer, principal, uh, Stoughton Industrial. Um, we have about 55 minutes for the conversation. Uh, we'll devote, uh, we'll leave maybe 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, we can start by having our panelists give a short introduction as to each one of them. We'll just start with. Yep. Hello, hi, my name is Craig Daniger with uh, Clary's Partners. Uh, I focus on acquisitions and leasing related to our developments in Chicago and with a particular focus in the Southeast. Uh, we are uh, developers based here in Chicago, but we have an office in Scottsdale as well. And we do developments in select markets uh, across the country. Uh, we do office, medical office, and industrial, and over the last few years, we've focused, for pretty obvious reasons, more and more, if not exclusively, on industrial, and uh, right now, we're keeping busy with uh, nearly 8 million square feet of uh, developments underway. Good morning. John, I'm, I'm glad we're not talking about uh, real estate taxes, because they, they are up, and they're beating me up on it, so uh, I'm glad we avoided that. Uh, good morning. I appreciate uh, Real Estate Journal having us out here uh, again for uh, this year's uh, event and uh, letting me sit up on stage with these three other gentlemen that are, you know, stellar in the community and and I bring down the average, I guess. Um, my name is Alfredo Gutierrez. I'm the president and founder of Sparehawk. We are a um, industrial exclusive investor. Uh, we don't develop. We uh, buy occupied uh, either on Ford, we'll, we'll do some Ford. So uh, you developers uh, that don't want to talk to some of the bigger guys, you can come talk to me. Um, and uh, we you know, obviously buy uh, second generation space from you know anybody that wants to uh, sell real estate in the Midwest, uh, where is, which is where we're active. Uh, currently have holdings in Chicago, in uh, St. Louis, Kansas City, uh, been active you know, in some of the other uh, secondary markets around there. Uh, but I appreciate y'all being out here and giving us the opportunity up here. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brock Herr. I'm Senior Vice President of Business Development and Attractions for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, or IEDC, as you'll probably hear me say. Uh, IDC is the lead economic development agency in the state of Indiana um, for all things economic development. My role specifically oversee all of our domestic business development functions. So business retention, expansion, attraction, and lead generation. 
And I am Dan Fogarty with Stoughton Industrial. It's a new company that was founded last summer by my partner, Jim McGill. Uh, I joined him right after the new year as chief investment officer, and we're on a mission to build a national development industrial platform. Um, Jim focuses on the Midwest, and I'm kind of the smile, so I'm very active in Georgia, Florida, Texas, up the Mountain West, and Vegas, Phoenix, Salt Lake City, a little bit in the Carolinas as well. So you're kind of like the Amazon, the smile, right? I love it. Everywhere where it's nice and warm and it's uh, sunny 80% of the time as opposed to 30% of the time here. But I love Chicago. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, so as a panel discussion, we'll just put some topics out there. I'll throw the question to one of the panelists and then feel free to discuss it amongst yourselves. Um, so the first uh, question I have here is... Uh, like to get the experts' uh, assessments of the state of the healthy industrial investment and capital markets, whether that be here in Chicago, Northwest Indiana, or in the various other markets that uh, you serve. So we'll start with uh, Alfredo. Man, you're just you're, you called me an expert. Even I'm, I'm coming. To, I'm coming back. This is awesome. Um, I appreciate. It. I, I tell you what. Obviously, as everybody knows, uh, the sector we're in is on fire, and um, I've been doing this for 30 years. And I've never had uh, this much just positive momentum, uh, even in, in light of some of the negativities that are out there in the uh, world with uh, you know, what's going on in Ukraine, uh, with interest rates, with the inflation. Um, you know, there's just tremendous appetite for industrial. And I would venture to say that going out and visiting our tenants, which I had the pleasure of doing the past few days, uh, visited all our buildings, all our tenants, uh, seeing the amount of growth and the excitement that our tenants are having, uh, which you know I was kind of thinking might be the exact opposite. Um, they're not there embracing the growth, their growth, uh, the growth in the sector, needing more space. And it just, I think, will continue to give us uh, a good runway uh, for where we are today, where we'll continue to go. So uh, I, I don't think there's, you know, a better time that I've seen in, in the years I've been doing this uh, to be an owner, to be a landlord, not a developer, but to be a developer. Um, I, I just, in every facet, I think it's, you know, it's our, it's our time in the sun. Yeah, I might just jump in there and say, across Indiana and Northwest Indiana specifically, very much what we're seeing. And in one hand, it's driven by market forces, the demand in the product that they're making maybe, or the reshoring efforts that are happening, but also in spite of the market forces of inflation and interest rates rising because they see the opportunity that's there. So whereas before they may truly have been walls or barriers that may have stopped a project or put it on hold, now they are simply you know mounds or hurdles to clear. Uh, along the way, um, because they do seem to be forging ahead, pretty much regardless. So in several markets that we develop in, vacancy rates are less than 1%, so effectively zero vacancy in several markets, which is just absolutely crazy, right? So at first blush, everything seems fantastic, and it really is fantastic. And um, you know, asset pricing is continuing to increase. Rental rates are continuing to increase. Supply and demand seems to be remaining in check despite the increased supply. Demand is is unprecedented, and um, despite these hurdles or squirrel, the squirreliness in the capital markets that are out there right now, potentially, um, I I do agree that the fundamentals are just so strong and industrial that. We um, need to be aware of the risk that's out there, but at the end of the day, uh, those fundamentals uh, on the demand side will prevail and uh, industrial is going to remain a very important and critical asset class for investors for years to come. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the, the vacancy because I really think if you dig into the vacancy numbers, uh, and just about anywhere. Hey, John, how you doing? <laughs> uh, uh, any uh, market that you're in, um, you know, you're you're five percent or less. You know, uh, I can't think of a market that has higher than five percent in the United States right now. But they got so much development coming on stream, and most of these markets have got, you know, five percent of their base coming on stream. 
uh, every year, and that's getting absorbed so fast. So when you look at the numbers, we can only, in general, 30, 40% of that coming on stream is, is pre-leased. So they're creating vacancy by delivering it into the market. So if you strip that out of the market, there isn't a vacancy. I mean, you know, if you're, you're 5%, you're probably really 2%. If you're 1%, as you said, you are zero. You're, you're creating the vacancy because you're delivering it. Um, and, and that's getting leased up, you know, in four months, we're opposed to, you know, nine or 12 months uh, that pre-pandemic you were seeing. All right, I, I love Alfredo, and I am very happy to hear all this positive news because I, I needed this right now because we tend to panic a little bit when you know things happen like the interest rates right now, which is certainly causing a momentary bit of uncertainty as to how we price things, which is our lifeblood. You know, we're going out and tying up land at all-time highs in every market, and my mantra has been recently: be the high bidder because the numbers will work because there is no supply. So be the high bidder, and right now I'm. You know, stepping back a little bit because there is uncertainty in how you price that that exit. So you make sure that you know your numbers are still going to work, but the underlying fundamentals, as you said, are still tremendous. And every market that we're working in, the list of tenants in the market well outpaces the amount of supply that's being delivered, even at record supply paces. I mean, Savannah, Georgia. Let's use that as an example. There's right now about 14 million square feet being delivered in a market of 85 million square feet. If you think about that in context of everywhere else around the country, that's what is that 20% of the supply is being added. And yet that 15 million would give people a pause. There's 35 million square feet of tenants in the market. So as soon as those pizzas are cooked, they're gonna get eaten. So just keep cooking them. Yeah, and in Indiana, at least what I will lightly say is the notion of a speculative industrial build almost at this point is it's not a thing because of what these gentlemen are talking about is the space is leased up before a shovel even goes into the ground. So yes, it is in a sense speculative because they're planning to put a tenant there, but they're not going up and sitting vacant for any meaningful bit of time. And the vacancies that are there are intentional and built in. Let me ask you this, Brock, so, I, which I think I agree with everything you said, but I, I think there's another element. You guys educate me on this. The forwards are at a pace that I've never seen. Um, you know, I thought I was stealth doing that, you know, 18 months ago, forget it. Everybody's doing it. So yes, you're taking inflationary risk, but, uh, I think you've got a, an out. Uh, I think you can mitigate some of your interest rate exposure, um, and, and make this thing work. Um, because, you know, not only do you have that leasing velocity, you have more institutionals in my opinion. And you guys tell me whether I'm crazy or not, uh, wanting to buy those empty buildings. You're absolutely right. Um, and I know we're going to get into kind of unique financing methods, and it kind of plays right into that is if you can eliminate risk of uncertainty two, three years down the line in terms of interest rates and lock something in now, uh, why wouldn't you, especially given the way the market is? Yeah, I think in a strange way, uh, some underwriting had been so aggressive on the equity side that the empty buildings are being valued way more than buildings that were cash flowing, which is just contrary to typical belief in the past, right? Um, so, you know, we interpret that as the dream is maybe worth more than the reality sometimes. And, um, you know, so far we've been living the dream in industrial, but at some point, you know, things will level off and we'll get back to a more normal reality. So to sort of pick up Brock, um, like, are you seeing other creative sources of capital out there? You know, I'll speak from a state government perspective. I'll let these guys talk to more of the private sector stuff, but at least from government in, or capital sources, yes. And I'll use Indiana as an example because I'm familiar with it. Um, on one hand, we've got a redevelopment tax credit program that operates as a traditional tax credit up to 20 million. But then anything above and beyond 20 million, the IEDC can offer as a loan structured of a loan. So to inject capital into a major development project early, um, provide a super low interest rate because we have the luxury of being a AAA credit rated state, run a balanced budget, unlike a jurisdiction I may be sitting in right now. Um, so we've got flexibility to do that, to offer basically rates just above what the state rate is, which right now we're in the kind of 2.2 range. Um, and it actually is offered as an option. 
to a company who can, if they want to access that piece of it, can access a loan with a rate that they know is locked in with an entity that's not going anywhere. But if they don't want to, if they can get a better rate on the market, then they can go after and pursue that option. So as, if it is a better rate or more attractive, like for in Cook County, some of the industrial, well, from my standpoint, in terms of uh, incentives for development are the 6B classification, which most commercial properties at 25% are industrial. This would put you at 10% of market value for assessment. But that, that incentive has a, uh, a the local uh, taxing jurisdictions and authorities have to make findings that, but for the incentive, the development wouldn't occur. And it seems to me, if you have any kind of incentives or creative financing that's hung on a hook that you have to meet a but for test, I don't see how that happens in this market. Yeah, and maybe that's, I'm um, an attorney by trade, so maybe that's how you define but for. Mm -hmm. And I will just say Indiana is interpreting of but for, we clear that hurdle when we actually process and make an offer of incentives, mm -hmm. not when we get into certification and contracting. Mm -hmm. So we've already made that assessment from the outset that they meet the qualification eligibilities by mm -hmm. statute, one of them being a competitive factor. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't necessarily want to speak to how Cook County does it, but mm -hmm. at least in Indiana at the state level, we cross that before we even issue an offer. So the hot market doesn't really affect these type of financing? N not at all. Options. And then another tool I will say that is very unique, that's different from the RTC is this new innovation development district that the state passed. It's for maybe very brute terms of describing it, it's a mega TIF tool that can allow the state and locals to join together and capture comprehensive revenue streams like a TIF. Um, and then there's two ways that it can be paid out to a company in a reward, kind of an ongoing revenue scenario, which is much more like an abatement or a certified technology park, but it can also have bonds issued against it um, that are issued and backed by the state of Indiana's Indiana Finance Authority AAA credit rating. Um, and so all of the publicly backed financing savings that you get with a AAA credit rating entity that's issuing those bonds for these mega projects can literally inject by statute, we can bond up to a billion dollars. The IDC has a billion dollar appropriation that we could bond against to provide financing um, for some of these. And it, it, that financing is an incentive sure. at the end of the day, but it's financing and it's through bond and capital markets, you know, we're building capitalized interest, debt service, coverage, all of that. And the net of that can still be offered back as a bond to a company. Dan, what are you seeing in the warmer climates? Anything unique? Specifically? In terms of great financing. markets, I mean, for, for financing. financing or just um, you know, I, I'm not really getting into a ton of creative financing, and we we're, we typically finance our projects with a 95.5 JV structure with institutional capital, um, which has been frothy. To go back to you know the the original statement, we're living in unprecedented you know robust times. Um, momentary trepidation with the rising interest rates, and um, that is causing construction debt to get repriced a bit here, which. Um, you know, is, is causing us to wonder, you know, where exit caps will go. And so there's a little bit of a pause here, but the underlying uh, fundamentals, the demand, so, you know, clearly outpacing supply and driving rents higher, no matter what headwinds hit us, mm -hmm. you know, keeps me very bullish. You know, but what I'll say, I mean, your, your structure is, you know, the, the bread and butter of our industry. It's been existing for a while. Um, and, and it's really not creative. Uh, but what I do think is thus far, I've seen the institutional, the life codes really holding firm on, you know, their LTVs. Um, and, you know, while they may be pushing rates up on us, um, the capital's coming in, the equity side, uh, that's, you know, bridging the difference between the loan and, and your 5%, um, is coming in at a much more aggressive number. Um, and, and so that's, that's not creative. Uh, it's fortunate because if you look, dial the clock back and you are around uh, to the late '90s before the you know the um, you know the 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 uh, correction of the tech bubble, um, you know we were pushing cap, we were pushing the leverage way too high. You're having deals doing ninety percent leverage, and you're just raising you know five percent or ten percent and not putting any skin in the game, and, and that you know leads to 
you know, somebody, you know, probably building a building that shouldn't be built. Um, every building built today needs to be built, but uh, we're not seeing that. And so it's not creative, but I do think the market's changing a little bit uh, in that regard. Where it'll be five years from now, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I do see that. I mean, I don't think the model's changing. I just think the stack's, the, the, the stack's changing. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, you know, obviously everybody's expecting interest rates to continue to move up. Normally they don't just, they don't move them in one jig, you know, they move over time in increments. And, you know, what's the impact? I'm obviously, if demand's so strong, are we, should we expect, you know, at least for the initial incremental increases, will it have much, if any impact on, I mean, sure, some demand would come off, I imagine, but if there's such a back pressure of demand, what impact are you expecting to see with the initial increases in interest rates? Yeah, I, I don't expect to see much of an impact from it immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it probably impacts, you know, uh, Dan a lot more than it does me because uh, that short-term debt is very meaningful to uh, a development project. Um, but uh, I, cap rates have, have always been uh, associated with interest rates, uh, but there's not a direct correlation, meaning, you know, the Fed moves the, the funds, you know, 25, 50 bips next week and cap rates are going to move 25, 50. They, they won't, uh -huh. you know. So um, what you're seeing is that long-term uh, deal, that 10 year, you know, credit, you know, Fortune 500 credit tenant that was always hey, everybody dreamed about that, that's what they want. Uh, cap rates are being compressed tremendously, uh, is, is having a little bit of a pause put on it. I'm not saying they're not transacting because they are, uh, but they're, they're putting a little pause on it because the problem is the structure of that lease, you know, because probably that lease has been worked on for, you know, six, 12 months or something, um, you know, had too low of inflation factor put into it. And so the ultimate institutional buyer is saying, I can't grow rents to get to where I need it to be. Uh, and it's a long-term lease. Uh, so it doesn't, that doesn't work for us too much. And, you know, the bond on Amazon or Home Depot, uh, you know, it's moving also. So, you know, maybe I do buy the, the actual bond itself. So I, I think it's, it's being looked at there. I don't see it happening yet, but I do think there's been a pause put on it. You guys seeing the same thing yet? Yeah. So I go, I go back to saying the thing that keeps saving us in, in such a, a robust market where somebody, we talked about vacancies being at all time lows and in a lot of markets and core markets like the Inland Empire, there's sub one, you know, and they're sub one in a lot of markets. When you look at class A product, certainly sub five is, as uh, Alfredo said. Um, so when vacancies go to zero, rent goes to infinity, I heard somebody say. So the tenants have been saving us every, every bit of headwind, whether it's inflation, the cost of all the buildings because of steel and precast and everything going up. Rents have just ra raised with them step for step or even outpaced them to keep those spreads where we need them. And the advice from you know, the capital markets folks that we're talking to now that are living this you know, this week, having things repriced on them because of the structure of the deal that was attractive 90 days ago and is no longer now. The advice they're giving is something that was said on earlier panels. 10 years is no longer sexy. Three and five years is sexy. 3% bumps are no longer good. Four to 5% bumps. So the way to avoid having your exit move up with you as you're underwriting the deal is to know going in that when you build this building, you're going to aim for five-year leases with four or 5% bumps so that you can still have a market leading exit cap and keep that spread there. So you just got to adjust these headwinds to an extent I always think are good because they keep us from getting too frothy and making stupid decisions. Right. Yeah, uh, getting back to your question about interest rates, I, I mean, rising interest rate on the, on the development side of things is going to add a little bit of, of cost to the overall development. Sure. But, you know, compared to the pricing increases that we're seeing just for actual commodities, hard costs, and so on, 
um, that is a much bigger hurdle to overcome and, and entirely agree with your point that rising rental rates solve all woes when it comes to, to rising costs, whether it's debt costs or hard costs or whatever the case may be, so that you can maintain those yields and those spreads and, um, you know, costs of, costs of debt, right. It's certainly not a one-to-one -one correlation for, um, uh, for when interest rates go up, cap rates are going to go up too. Um, I do believe that they will go up slightly. Maybe it's more 0.2 or 0.3 to one. Um, so there's some upward pressure there, but there is some downward pressure too for if you've got the right types of leases in place with the same kind of terms that, that you mentioned there. Um, capital markets certainly have just a tremendous appetite for industrial still right now, but that availability of capital is really the, 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 the force that's counteracting the, the, the upward pressure. And at the end of the day, um, not only does it counteract it, I think that there's still room potentially for some of those cap rates to, to get back down. So do you think they can go lower or? I, I certainly do think that they can go lower than they are today. Um, I don't think that we will see them go lower in the very immediate sense while there's some uncertainties in the market right now. Um, you know, I, if cap rates were three and a half percent and you're selling, you still think they're at three and a half percent, but if you're buying, you're probably thinking they're at 4%. Right. And so I think that's naturally just going to cause some well, pausing if you're, if you're in transaction. They're like 7%. If you're arguing about <laughs> value. No. <laughs> so um, I think they could go down, I guess, is the, is, is the short answer. And I, again, I think that the fundamentals are so strong that over time that they may. Um, and even if they do go up a bit, that's not necessarily, a bad thing because if you know if cap rates go up a bit and the um and, and your your yields go up a bit because rental rates continue to go up because of that that demand is still there then you're still maintaining your spreads and that, that still maintains a, a healthy industry for us all to to invest and participate in the i would argue that um you know they could go up they could go down uh i think what is in what i've seen is cap rates aren't the measure anymore. Uh, you know, the, the yields, the IRRs are, are much more important in the underwriting, the evaluation than cap rates ever were. Cap rates are just easy to do. You know, you can do it on a napkin uh, and figure it out real fast. Um, it is a measurement. It is a measurement we'll continue to use, but I, I, I think we've gotten past the point where it's the measurement. Uh, you're going to look at the other values, and if the cap rate goes up because of those other computations, it went up. If it went down because of those other computations, it you know it went down. But it's just no longer the measurement. And if I can just add anecdote to that, so from the IEDC standpoint, particularly when we look at these unique financing things, our driving metric actually is an internal rate of return, as well as an indirect and an induced benefit internal rate of return on a project that I'm working with right now with a particular utility, we're actually looking at financing and infrastructure costs too. And the driving number I would presume on their side based on conversations has been their IRR threshold. So it, it is still a consideration, very important one. You don't wanna lose your you know, shirt on a bad cap I rate, but the IRR seems to be a driving factor for us, certainly at the IDC, how we score deals and even some of our partners that we've worked with on some of these transactions. So um, moving, talking about capital flowing in an industrial uh, real estate market, typically for acquisitions, um, well, what are you seeing with the capital construction financing? Are there any trends that are seeing there? Uh, are terms changing? Uh, we can throw that to Alfredo. Biden, that's your best guy on, on construction because I'm not a developer, right? Maybe one of you guys can do it. And I, I can talk about Dan, you want to yeah. take it? Yeah, sure. I mean, as we said, there, it's rates are going up. So the debt to the construction debt's getting a little more expensive. Um, and that's certainly, um, you know, changing the equation a bit, but the capital is still plentiful. So I think, you know, the question is, yeah, capital is construction debt is free flowing into the market. There's the lenders are uh, very competitive. 
Um, so it'll keep it from going, the rates from going too high because there's, there's a lot of different alternative sources. Um, and as Alfredo pointed out earlier, you know, the loan, loan to cost is still staying in the 60 to 65 percent range, which is very responsible. You know, you've got a, the, the developers like us and our, and, our, and our sponsors, the LPs, will, will continue to have a lot of skin in the game. So that makes the lender very comfortable. So I, it'll keep flowing, but probably just get a little more expensive, that, that piece of the stack. Yeah, I agree. I think we're seeing um, a few construction lenders sitting the sideline a little bit, but um, not enough to not have a market, right? And so we're seeing, you know, where it was very easy to get 65% non-recourse construction loans on a spec, um, it's still possible. You might have to have a little higher yielding uh, uh, d development plan in order to achieve that, um, but you could still achieve it pretty easily still with a little bit of recourse and if and still non-recourse at 60%, which is still a, a great loan to cost um, and you know relatively still you know e easy to find out there. Uh, Craig, just to maybe move a little bit towards the negative, like are you seeing other headwinds in the market uh, and what if any effects it having on investment besides what we've already discussed? Uh, besides what we've already discussed, I, I guess I mentioned it briefly already, but, um, and some of the earlier panels mentioned it too, and that's just continued rise in construction costs. So we've seen over the last year, spec shell buildings increase, what, 50 to 70%, depending on what product type you're looking at. But that's uh, just an insane increase in, in just about one year. And it does seem to be that that is plateauing a little bit, but it, you still have to factor in the risk there and there's still uh, growth and in, in pricing that's probably going to outpace inflation. And so one way or another, you need to price it in, you know, you can put so much as much as you possibly can into your, uh, into your actual development budgets. Um, you may need to price in uh, additional spreads in order to cover that risk as well. Um, so it, it's a headwind that um, really can only be overcome by increasing rental rates. And so far, uh, the, the met demand has suggested that that is uh, okay, that, that, that solves all woes, right? Um, but uh, it's definitely a risk and a headwind that continues to be out there and will be for the foreseeable future. But with, with the demand and with the lack of available space, maybe you can't go to infinity, but you're getting the, you're, you're able to structure the deals and get the money to cover that. and. Also your profit. Maybe I'll jump in. So yeah, so last year uh, that was kind of freaking me out more than anything with how fast the pricing was going up on steel and everything. And we were wondering, all right, will the rent keep pace? And it has obviously because we've got this vacancy. What's concerning me more than price increase now is the lag time on a lot of these materials. Um, you know, now as, as a previous panel mentioned, you know, precast lots are out 13, 14, 15 months, depending on what market you're in. So it's causing you to consider doing tilt up instead of precast in cold markets where you, you know, that was never really considered before. Um, you know, roofing material maybe or maybe not showing up. Nobody can commit to it, you know, and it's cost us. And my, my previous employee, you know, companies were doing build-a-suits and we're supposed to be giving occupancy in October and we're waiting around for a roof that doesn't show up until January. Uh, rest of the building's, you know, complete basically. So I think the lead times on these commodities is, is, is an even more daunting headwind than the increasing costs. Yeah, and to kind of stick with the negative theme, if you will, um, you know, developers, they can still get that access to capital and build it into the cost. We do hear projects and companies saying, we either think this inflationary period's transitory and we're gonna wait and hold off. We're not gonna pay our developer that overbuild. Um, and then in some cases, it's exactly what he said. Their timelines of these projects do not align with the supply chain timelines of getting new materials there. And we have seen companies pivot and retrofit existing facilities or kind of shoehorn things into existing operations as a short-term measure, um, but as an option in lieu of building a new facility. Um, and in part, it's construction costs going up, frankly, access to construction labor, which also is part of a construction cost. But uh, we hear companies saying we could pay 150% above union wage rates and we still can't find 
construction workers, which is absurd to hear. Um, and so those are some decisions that companies are making that obviously influ influence the developers to say, even if we wanted to move forward, we just, we can't swallow that pill right now. Um, I will say that is industry specific. There are some industries, as I alluded to at the top, microelectronics, EV battery manufacturers, controlled ag operations, they are moving forward despite of these pressures and headwinds. So maybe the comment I just made is more for a company in a commodity space, like a steel manufacturer or something, where they see not only their construction costs rising, but their actual inputs into their product also going up and they're saying, hey, we think this is out of control. Let's put a pause or maybe let's pivot and do a shorter term measure. And I'll say personally, the, the headwind that I'm facing is we have way too much competition on, on these deals. So what we decided is all you investors out there, we're going to, Ernie's going to pass around some straws. The three short straws, you're not bidding against me anymore, right? That solves the problem. Now, in all seriousness, um, you, I, what I do, what these guys have voiced is, is the headwind is is the inflationary factor on the commodity um <clears throat> the other thing that concerns me as a second generation buyer is right now it is it appears to be too lucrative to the unsophisticated and we have been fortunate enough for the last you know 20 plus years for the new product that's coming out of the ground to be built by developers that have the knowledge, have the institutional backing to build good product. Um, and I, I, I'm fearful that, you know, someone's going to look at the dollar signs and decide suddenly, I have a truck, I have a tool belt, I'm now a developer. Um, and that's what I would be concerned with as a second generation buyer. Uh I don't know if he's got a crystal ball, but you know, Brock, when you talk about some of these people saying, well, we're just going to pause. I mean, is, can, does anybody have a handle on how, how long it'll take, for example, do we expect the issues with construction costs and supply of materials? Is that going to be resolved sooner rather than later? Or what, what's the thinking out there? If I had the answer to that, I don't know if I'd be sitting on the right. panel. <laughs> Go to Vegas. Um, well, if you had a guess, what do you, you know, I think again, I, I would say maybe it's more industry specific mm -hmm. and what the company that's behind the development. and tertiary suppliers follow and they too because they have to be next to that company that in some cases they run in a pipe into their building mm -hmm. they don't really have a choice whether they move forward or not so they're going to be forging ahead as well and it'll be navigating these issues i do think you know when you're in more of the commodity space and companies like a steel company making a commodity <laughs> that also is using those commodities into their facility, those are where I think we will see a bit more of a slowdown and a mm -hmm. cautionary approach. And to your ultimate question, when will that ease? Not really sure. Um, you know, I think the hope is now that we're getting into warmer weather, now that we're kind of coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, some of those discretionary, I guess, dollars may be going away that were there for the last couple of years that there are going to be people that are getting back into the workforce that are going to help fill some of these construction mm -hmm. jobs that'll bring that price down that hopefully some of these supply chain strains uh get sorted over the next or they already are in large respect um, but that eases some pressure as well that'll make some of those companies i think feel a bit better to okay let's pull the hold and continue to move forward but some of these industries it's they're moving forward regardless and their tier two tier three suppliers are going to have to follow and they're just going to have to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, when, when you said pause, I, I don't think that there's really any pause that's going to be happening when it comes to speculative development in terms of putting product into the markets because of vacancy we talked about and the demand drivers we're talking about. I think the pause that we're likely to see here more immediately is more transactional related in terms of, you know, if you're, if you're 12 months out from delivering a building, 
it might be pretty difficult to to price where rental rates need to be based on how the capital markets are moving on both the debt and, and the equity side, right? So you either are going to have to build in a, uh, or be encouraged to build in a, a much more aggressive spread to account for that uncertainty, or you're going to want to have a metric in place that where you could actually have the rental rate be set more towards the the end of, of construction and the, and the commencement of their lease. Um, and then you know, again, also just some transactional pause related to buyers and sellers for existing assets because they're just not really seeing eye to eye on, on where cap rates should be heading right now. Yeah, I, I don't have a crystal ball either. Um, but I, I do think in a lot of these markets and Chicago is, I would lump into that market, um, either it's by choice or, or by coincidence, the supply and demand growth have, have paralleled each other and, and stayed within a nice bandwidth, which is where you want it to be. Um, so you're not looking at uh, a balloon that's getting too much air um, and you're saying, you know, it's gonna pop, it's a matter of when. Uh, right now everybody thinks, yeah, I've seen this before, it's gotta pop, but the numbers aren't dictating it. Uh, so no one knows when that's gonna occur. Do I think that there's a extra, you know, cream that's on these numbers that, you know, these guys are being quoted on their steel and the roof. And um, absolutely, because the, the, the trades are so freaking busy. Um, they're just kind of throwing numbers out because they're saying, heck, if you'll pay that, I'll do the job for you. Uh, and so there is, there is some cream in there. Uh, will that cream disappear? Sure. Um, you know, will we see pricing drop back down to where it was 2019? Absolutely not. We will not see that. Uh, there'll be a settlement. And, and really where I think there's a lot of runway, we have just so much, you know, tailwinds supporting our industry, you know, that we've got a ways to go on this. It isn't forever, um, but just watch the numbers um, and, you know, quit listening to the noise and actually read what's going on. And when you see, you know, the, the supply outpacing demand, okay, now this that's when we have to have this conversation, in my opinion. Well, if I'm, you know, if we had this panel a year from now, it seems like it would be fairly similar to what we're talking about now. Maybe some of these supply chain issues that are driving costs may be resolved and maybe in, inflation by then will, moved enough to have some impact, but it seems like this discussion is going to be going on in the same way for quite a while. I'll right? just jump in and piggyback on what they said. I, I think there's, you know, you're, nobody ever, it seems like nobody ever wants to say, well, we got five years of runway, but we need well over a billion square feet, I think, by most measures of additional supply added, you know, starting with Prologis saying maybe 800 million, 900 million square feet. Um, because of the inventories being much lower than where most logistics, most suppliers, retailers want them to be. Um, so I think this is going to go on, you know, we'll, we'll, a year from now, we'll be talking about what the headwinds are then, but I think we're still going to be in a very good place in the year after that. And I'm hoping the year after that, I, and I would, if I had to bet on it, I'd bet that we'll keep going well here. I just read that he said we're going to look the same. I was like, awesome. I'm not more gray hair. This, uh, did I mishear him? No, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely agree with, with what the rest of the panelists are saying as well. Um, if there's one concern I have that would turn what is very positive momentum into potentially some negative momentum, it's just simply related to consumer demand. And I, I do believe that consumer demand will remain strong, but the, the biggest risk out there related to that, I, I think is uncontrolled inflation. And the inflation that we're experiencing right now is really twofold. One was because of all the money that was pumped into the economy as stimulus during COVID, which was critical for us to not go into a massively deep recession right off the bat. But at the end of the day, perhaps it may have been too much for too long and maybe not directed in, in all the right places. And But now interest rates are going back up to try to curtail that and, and, and cool, cool things down. And then the other factor in, for the inflation is the supply chains. And um, I do agree that there's reason to believe that those supply chain issues will begin to work themselves out. And in part, 
Um, I think it's because hopefully COVID is truly becoming more and more behind us for real. I think in, in the US anyways, we're all kind of behaving like like that's the, the case for, for better or worse and seemingly for the better. Um, but in China, for example, they still have a zero COVID case requirement. And so they're still shutting down their economy and disrupting supply chains that are all affecting us right now. Um, but again, I, I do believe that that will begin to work itself out over the course of the next the next year. And um, all those will be positive in terms of uh, curtailing inflation, which will combine with the, the wage growth that's been healthy for for the for United States workforce, um, people will continue to have money to spend and they'll continue to be consumer demand. But there is risk that none of that happens. So we all just need to be aware of the risk out there. I have a question. I've been walking around the room, so I'm sorry if this was touched on, but is, is, is it easier to be a buyer or a seller in today's market? Uh, or is it is it uh, is the market better just to hold on to what you have? There's so many layers in that earning. Yeah. Um, yeah <laughs> it's the, so the question you started with is that easier to be a buyer or seller? It clearly is easier to be a seller because it's yeah. a seller market. Um, you know, now as a seller, you, you're saying, okay, I can sell that asset and I'm going to make a nice profit. My investors, uh, you know, are going to praise me and, and take me out and, and buy a nice dinner, which I like dinners. Um, and, and that's wonderful. But now what are you going to do with that money? Where are you going to redeploy it? Uh, and that makes it difficult. So, but now you're a buyer. So your question is, is a difficult yeah. one. Um, you know, being a holder uh, in this market, I don't think it's a wrong answer. Um, I think you got to, you know, look inward and evaluate what were your objectives when you set up your investment group and, and be honest with yourself. Um, because I'm a firm believer uh, as an investor that if you sat down with your investors and said, we want to have a 2x on this investment, and you're sitting at 3x, you've achieved your investment objectives, you know, capitalize on your investment objectives, and, and move on, because there is other opportunities. And it's not easy, but don't sit back and say, I, I'm not going to execute on a plan that we set out in a good plan that we set out that we've overachieved already, uh, because I'm afraid. Um, you know, that, you know, we are buyers, we are sellers. Uh, at the end of the day, I want to be a net buyer always. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question other than if, if looking at it in, in, a, vol in a vacuum, uh, yes, today's a, a seller's market, so it is easier to be a seller. Might as well open it up to questions yep. for the room. Anybody? Bueller? Final thoughts? Got a question back there. There we go. Thank you. Thanks so much. This is probably a question for Craig. Um, just again, we've got volatilities all over the world. You talked about uh, you know China, and we're obviously having the the war in Ukraine, and that's actually impacted the supply chain. Can anybody talk about the the um, onshoring of goods and services here in the United States? how that's actually impacting industrial space. Thank you. I'll go first. Uh, so when we talk about strong fundamentals in industrial real estate, that's certainly one of them. It's e-commerce growth, it's onshoring, and it's, and it's uh, increasing inventory levels. And the last two are directly related to uh, supply chain issues, right? And uh, manufacturing, uh, coming back to the United States or just continuing to grow in the United States um, has a tremendous trickle down effect uh, for the economy at large and certainly for the industrial real estate market with tier two and three suppliers. And 
perhaps one of the best parts about it too is that it's tremendously sticky, right? It's a it's a, it's a very expensive investment for those uh, for those businesses that are uh, choosing to manufacture in the United States and. Um, and so in terms of duration for that, you mentioned three or five years, I think it's really you know, 15 years because uh, it's so sticky. I would just double down on that. I mean, the, the mega projects that we're tracking that are effectively reshoring, these are projects where they're talking to us about 20, 30, 40 year horizons and continued development and attracting a clustering of their supply chains. So they are certainly looking well beyond a three, five year runway. Um, into the decades on these mega developments. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah. Follow up? Sure. sure. I can't hear you. So. so, if that's in fact the case, you know, we're talking about the big R word. And if that, if a recession is actually coming, the fundamentals that we're seeing on the ground would actually paint a much different picture. Because obviously, you know, you've got, you know, we still have supply chain challenges, but yet the, we don't have enough product to be built. So we're not going to have a supply demand imbalance. It, it just seems that the, the fundamentals just continue to grow. And even though we're talking about a recession, what we're seeing on, on the ground in terms of job growth, uh, you know, smaller businesses expanding, that just seems to be creating the velocity within the industrial sector. Am I missing something? Alfredo, you're the smartest guy on the panel. Come on. Oh, man. I love you guys. <laughs> Can you call my wife and tell, tell her that? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I, I do think there's um, definite talk about, you know, you know, that we're in a recession and all those kind of things. Um, but I, I'm not seeing it when when I'm you know out in the field and talking to other operators, uh, some of my tenants and, and future potential tenants. Um, they're all seeing positive growth. Um, I do think there's a good bit of reshoring going on. And in my opinion, I think there's more nearshoring going on than reshoring, and uh, I don't think that gets as much credit as it needs to. It, it's a different economic boost. I mean, obviously, you don't care about nearshoring, but, um, you know, to some degree, yeah. yeah. It's coming over from <laughs> Illinois when you nearshore. Oh, well, you're, you're just defining the border. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I do think you, you're going to, that, you know, the corporate America is going to move to where the labor is uh, abundant and, reasonable and you know not to get political on this because i'm not trying to uh where there's not as much uh you know oversee from the government on what they can and can't do and i'm not trying to say it's good to be a bad corporate citizen i'm not saying that but you know if you have the ability to react and you know, produce whatever that widget is faster that's not a bad thing as long as you're doing it still responsibly. So I do think a lot of that's going to be in Mexico. I think we're going to be having some final assembly in the States. And I do think that's going to be a tremendous benefit to a market like Chicago uh, and to some other markets throughout the Midwest, uh, because as that product leaves Mexico and starts moving up and has to be dispersed amongst the United States, it's going to land in one of these you know, regional distribution points, and that if it's going to be a regional distribution point, it's either going to be Dallas or it's going to be Chicago. Uh, and, you know, once it lands in Chicago, it's, it's then going to, you know, other DCs to distribute out to the, to the population. And so, you know, look at the map, look at the number of cities that are large, significant cities that, that are spread and dotted throughout the Midwest, uh, that that's going to so that's that's going to benefit all those things and so it's it's not just about the manufacturing themselves and what they're putting in here it's where's that product going and how's it getting there and if you don't have to bring it across the ocean that makes a lot more sense uh, see i told you it was the smartest guy on the panel and i'm glad he said that too so it, we like to say in indiana we're the crossroads of america we have three highest or the 
the most pass through interstates in the country. And it goes to the point of the Midwest, you can basically get to 60, 70% of the US population within a 12 to 15 hour drive. And so when you layer in not only proximity to end customers, but also the nature of what some of these reshoring products are, I mean, they're medicines, they're food supplies, they're microelectronics that go in everything that we do. That I think gives at least me the confidence to see that there is this longer runway, even if a recession comes, because these are staples of life that people need. And because of all of the factors we've talked about, companies and developers are seeing, despite maybe more government oversight than what I see in Southeast Asia, there are so many more commercial benefits for me to be within 12 hours of 60% of the US population. Well, I don't think we have any more questions. We've pretty much run the time. Okay. So I want to thank the panelists for, for spending the time with us today. Thank you very much. And I just want to make a final comment before we give another round of applause for all our speakers and sponsors. Uh, just to, uh, for your information, our annual Illinois Real Estate Journal Awards event is going to be July 13th. I'm sure you've been inundated with quite a few emails to support or encourage you to nominate your company your company's individuals for quite a few categories that we have up this year, this year for the nomination form. So that is due Friday. If you need a bit more time, we can accommodate you, uh, but I know the judging will begin after May 6th. So please keep that in mind. I encourage you to submit nominations. So with that, let's give a round of applause for all of our speakers panel today. Appreciate it. Have a great year and we'll see you again. Thanks.